fantastic. It's fantastic. <laughs> and they archive the whole recording. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's on YouTube. Yeah. I will share the link afterwards. Okay, I think all is ready. So ladies and gentlemen, very welcome to this uh, small seminar in the afternoon of the PhD defense of Haicheng uh, Liu. I think we have uh, four very uh, nice presentations, uh, a bit related topic about multidimensional data, uh, point clouds, which was the thesis topic, uh, digital twins, 3D models used there, and registering the legal aspect, land administration, the rights, the restrictions. Uh, we have a break halfway. Uh, Thomas has to leave in the second half. It is not because of non-interest in the second half, but traveling uh, onwards. So he is uh, as the first presenter, Thomas Kolder from uh, TU Munich. Uh, he will explain about the developments of uh, using point clouds as geometry representation in, uh, in city models in city GML. So uh, I'm really looking forward to this, uh, Thomas. Please come forward. I will start your presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for the nice introduction. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, so, um, I have the pleasure to present some work that we did together with a couple of, uh, of uh, team members. So, uh, you see the names here. Um, so, that means um, um, certain aspects of what I'm going to show today have been done by different people of that, of that round. And um, the presentation is mostly adapted from last year's 3D GeoInfo presentation. We have a, had a paper there on this topic. So also, if you're interested in getting more details, of course, you can ask me and the other possibilities also to check, uh, check the paper. Um, actually, what's the motivation of linking point clouds and semantic 3D city models? No, so what people are normally doing is you use point clouds to derive semantic 3D city models from it. So you say I have a recognition tool or a modeling tool, and then basically I get rid of all the points and try to have very clean representations of polygons and solids, etc. Et and then typically you associate a lot of uh, thematic information with these objects. So that's one, one of the interests. Um, on the other side, of course, that's quite expensive. And I mean, um, we have improvements in the autom automation of this, but still we are not yet there that we can basically take a point cloud uh, and then come out with a level of detail three model or when we talk with, about BIM, a full blown BIM model, that's not something that is at the moment in the reach. It's uh, uh, because it's, it's, uh, there are so many details that you would have to reconstruct and so you have to do so many assumptions that it would be very difficult to get such a, such a model out of it. So now what, why is that important? Yeah, everybody of probably have, has heard about this development of urban digital twins or generally about digital twins. And the question is or sometimes, is a point cloud already the digital twin or is a city model already the digital twin? Uh, my answer is no. So they are components, they are important components of the digital twin, but the digital twin is much more. First of all, it is something like an ongoing uh, process. So we not just have one model, one snapshot in time, but we will have an ongoing development and ongoing changes uh, into the data. Um, and that refers not maybe to just one city model representation, but maybe even more. So people can use point clouds, 3D meshes, they can use a semantic model and they can use BIM at the same time. And none of them will replace the others. That's quite, at least that's what my current uh, uh, guess is uh, on this. And cities, for example, like Rotterdam, but also Helsinki, they are really making use of that. So they are using all these kind of uh, representations because all of them have strengths and weaknesses. And since we do not have a one fits all representation today, maybe we will never have. That means the digital twin, the urban digital twin consists of many different representations, depending also on the applications and the use cases that you have. Another aspect, maybe just a little bit, I'm, I'm going a little bit off topic, but, uh, but the, um, another aspect, of course, is that digital twins 
you also have all the other data in cities, like the statistics about unemployment, for example, in a, in a city that is data about the city and it should belong to the digital twin because it's, it's uh, if you have sensor data about uh, traffic counting or about sensor data about air quality, etc. All of that belongs uh, typically because it, 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 it reflects properties of the city and that's basically so the digital twin of a, of a, of a city is really something a very big thing, but it's a nice umbrella under which we can also integrate the different kinds of 3D representations. So what we see, however, is definitely the increased relevance of point cloud data. So it's, a, it's a, not just a young phenomenon, but latest, I would say, with the invention of uh, dense stereo matching, uh, we have seen many more and cheaper ways to produce uh, high resolution 3D point clouds. So from using drone imagery, so it's still, very expensive today, today buy, to buy a laser uh, scanner, but now you can use photogrammetry and produce high resolution point clouds very cheaply, very quickly. And uh, also, um, yeah, to generate, as I said, building information modeling, semantic 3D city models, people start off with uh, point clouds. And here, especially in Delft, uh, there is a, there's a good uh, place to also investigate the native usage of point cloud and possibly to see how far can we get with point clouds without even using BIM or without even going into semantic 3D city modeling. And it turns out certain questions already could be handled and covered to a certain extent or to some extent of here, of course. Then uh, also um, virtually testing autonomous driving systems is of course also another motivation why we want to not just work with point clouds but also with linking point clouds with real 3D city models, because um, we have cars driving around, they constantly measure and, uh, and survey the, the area. And, uh, and so we want to align this data on the one hand side to, of course, locate the, the cars. But the, the other question is, we want to find out whether the stored data of our environment is still up to date and where we possibly have to make updates. Where can we recognize maybe uh, construction sites? Uh, where can we recognize changes of lane geometries of streets etc so this is also uh, a question and typically these cars again produce from their data so they have radar scanners they have photogrammetry they have uh, um, uh, laser scanners on board so they again produce a lot of point clouds so what you see here on this picture is uh, are some screenshots from things that we have been working on and um, uh, for example uh, on the bottom left you see the point cloud that has been acquired by mobile mapping system driving around uh, some some streets and um, on the other side from that point cloud data uh, a company a commercial company has created open drive data open drive is a, is a standard from the automotive industry that is being used for driving simulation and it includes uh, very detailed information about the road uh, geometries but th that goes down to the lane level and it also includes all the information about all kinds of restrictions like what's the speed limit to what are driving restrictions etc all of that i mean there has been already a format for that that is being used in, in car navigation systems called gdf which is still uh, being used today but open drive is um, is explicitly 3d and also uh, has a lot more uh, features and also the geometries are represented using parametric splines parametric uh, um, uh, geometries so, um, so the, from that representation of open drive, we have now developed tools to derive a city GML representation from it. That's shown in the middle on the bottom. So that means um, from an implicit representation where we just say that we have a line center, we, uh, the lane center line, and then we all have um, the information about how width, how, how, what's the width of, of a lane and uh, how the curb stones are, et cetera. So all of that information has been just encoded in a parametric way. And what we do is we create an explicit representation from it. So that means um, we are using polygons, we are producing polygons from that, and that can then be shown and used and visualized uh, very nicely. Uh, on the top right, you see another example where we, at the moment, we are looking uh, also in, into the question. So we have a, have a research project together with the company Audi, where we want to use uh, 3D city models to, um, to simulate um, the uh, uh, reliability of uh, the sensors and the sensor data that is required by autonomous cars. 
So in that purpose, uh, for that purpose, we want to, uh, um, on the one hand side, learn from the cars about material properties of, for example, the walls. We want to know where, where's glass, where's wood, where's concrete, where's metal, so that we can enrich the city models with this information so that on the next step, if you have a simulated car with simulated sensors, we can basically simulate the, the, the signal response according to the materials that we have. So we want to know whether when, and when a certain kind of ra radar uh, um, is being used on a, on, a, on a car, how would the, the radar signal be uh, looking like when the car drives a certain, a certain pathway? And that information can then be fed again into the localization software that is already there in the car in order to see whether it's robust enough. And um, if you change the location of sensors, if you change the style of sensors in, in, a, in a car, whether the, the systems are still working reliably. And for that purpose, we need very high uh, resolution city models. And the city models need to have the information about the material information so that we can really do a good sensor simulation afterwards. And in order to do that, we basically currently are looking how can we automatically overlay, how can we automatically um, link single point measurements from, from, the, from the sensors to the individual objects of the city of the city model data set. That's that's one one reason here. Okay. So of course some advantages of point clouds are I, I, I possibly don't have to tell that in this round here much. So we have a broad range of acquisition techniques. It's highly automated uh, in the data gathering process. And um, it's also a uniform and quite simple data structure based on attributed points you could say. Um, and um, you, it allows also to have, uh, it depends just on the density of the points, basically, how much geometric detail you basically include in that. So you don't have to choose different data structures or something. So you just increase the point density in those areas where you have high uh, geometric detail. And limitations, however, of course, are the semantics that are being stored and maintained in point clouds are not very well supported yet. So there have, we have the last format, for example, and that allows you to store with each individual point a vector of attributes. So the, the point has a 3D coordinate typically, maybe also a GPS time that is associated with it. And then you have things like color, maybe information, you have information about the intensity of the reflected laser pulse. Um, and there is one attribute that is a class label. So you can basically say that is a ground point, that's a building point or whatever, however, it's just a byte. And so it, it can in principle have 256 different classifications. I think at the moment, uh, the ALS stem, the, the last time has specified 30 classes around, around that. And um, I think this is okay to, to make a first assessment of, of laser data. So if you want to distinguish what are building points, what are vegetation points, that's fine but you cannot distinguish individual objects in there. I cannot say these points belong to that building. These points belong to the, to the, to the trunk of that, of that tree. And these points belong to the trunk of the next tree. So this, this kind of information, the object ID information is something that is um, at least not advised at the moment in the, in the standard. And of course, you know, from BIM and also maybe from semantic city models, we can have also aggregations. So we can have one object consisting of sub-objects, the sub-objects again consisting of other sub-objects, and these hierarchies are also not representable in, in, these, in these point cloud data. So um, then also there, there is no connection as, as, as today of on the one hand side point cloud data and semantic models like CDGML or IFC for example. And there's one more drawback, semantic objects for which there are no points cannot be represented. So something that is not visible where I don't have a detected point, I cannot, I mean, also I cannot store it. Uh, and so the idea is, of course, several people have been already working on this idea of semantic point clouds. For example, in Liege, uh, we have uh, some, some examples for that. I will not go into too much detail on this. Uh, there have been also people working on extending IFC to integrate point cloud data on that one, and uh, also uh, the possibility to include semantic information into point clouds by including building IDs that was already uh, suggested by Virtanen. And um, but the limitations of these are first of all the objects 
where no point data is available. So obscured backyard fa facades cannot be represented by these representations. So you, are, you can add some semantics to it, but if there are no points, no semantics. Uh, and most approaches, however, yeah, focus just on using the classification labels, but not on concepts for hierarchically structuring aggregated objects. And uh, so using existing and established semantic concepts would then be beneficial. And so the benefits that you would get is you can connect, if you, if you would be able to link point clouds with, city, uh, with semantic city models, you could connect the, uh, between the point cloud and the semantic objects, and you can run analysis and simulations based on the point cloud geometries um, using detailed semantic information by the city models. So in the city models, we have associated thematic data, like information about the ownership, the age of the building, for example, uh, uh, numbers of stories and uh, the appraised value of a building or something like that. So all these kind of thematic information, and that can now be used in conjunction with the point cloud then. You can also do a th thematic search of point cloud parts. So just select all the points belonging to uh, the west wall of that building. That would be uh, something that is interesting. And of course, uh, improved segmentation, spatial indexing for efficient visualization could be, could be done. And um, yeah, you can also uh, employ, elaborate, and establish semantic and hierarchical concepts, for example, provided by CityGML. So the idea, when that is something that we have implemented in the new CityGML standards, so CityGML version 3.0 now has concepts to link uh, point clouds with semantic city models. And I will show you how we do that. Um, you see here just uh, two excerpts from the data model of, uh, of CityGML. I don't know if you, if, you, if you are familiar already with the standard. Um, in the new version of CityGML 3, we have recast all classes into the, cons into the framework of spaces and space boundaries. So in general, we look at the city and say, we have things in reality that occupy a volume and we have things which basically bound a volume. So if you think at the terrain model, the terrain model is a boundary surface. It's just the boundary surface that bounds the, the ground material, or you can also say it bounds the air space above, uh, above the ground. So it's just a surface. Uh, if you think about the building and look from a helicopter to a building, then the building occupies a space in the urban area. So the building is an occupied space. If you look at a street, if you're standing on a street, the street itself is also a volume because if it wouldn't be a volume, you wouldn't be able to walk or to drive a car. So it's an open space, an unoccupied space, but it's still a 3D volumetric extent. And the ground surface, so the, where, where the cars drive on, that's a traffic surface. So it's just one bounding surface of that, of that space. So the idea was in CityGML, we recast every CityGML object. So buildings, building parts, uh, streets, uh, uh, water bodies, etc. Everything is being recast now under the structure of being an unoccupied and occupied space. And we further make the distinctions between what we call a logical space and a physical space. So physical space are those spaces where we can observe a boundary. So something like the walls there where we can use a scanner. Logical spaces are, for example, when you can say uh, maybe a security area inside a building. That's something that is per definition by, by, by some humans. Or you say we have city areas. Um, for example, here is that city district A, and that definition is also this def defining a volume, and everything in that volume belongs to that city district. So that volume is then also a logical space. And uh, so what you see here is now a part of this class hierarchy. And you can see that we have this class called um, abstract physical space. And physical spaces can be bound by thematic surfaces. So that means a, a building can be bound by a wall surface, by a roof surface, by a ground surface. A room in which we are is bound by a floor surface, by a ceiling surface, by interior wall surfaces. And um, if you have a bridge, the bridge also has bounding surfaces. So the bridge also has ground surfaces, it also has wall surfaces, and maybe also the deck surface, you could say. But we also use, um, for that purpose, uh, the roof surface, and say that that's basically the roof of the, of the, of the bridge. So um, that means the, the boundaries are also semantically classified. 
And, um, and, uh, and then with the abstract physical space, we now allow an additional geometry and that's shown on the right. Maybe I can use the mouse here. You can see now any city GML object that is a subclass of a physical space is now allowed to have a point cloud associated. And the same is true also for a thematic surface. So that means if you are familiar with CityGML, every building can, be rep can also have a point cloud representation, but also every single wall surface of a building can have a point cloud representation. Even the window of a building can have for itself just a point cloud representation. So that means not the entire building must be available as a point cloud. If you're just interested for your application that you have a point cloud for one, one facade, then you just attach the point cloud to that one facade, but not more. And uh, so that's, that's also possible. And the way how we represent point clouds is very simple because we simply say a point cloud can on the one hand side be represented just as a multi-point. So that basically means inside the CDGML file, you simply really list all the points, which is not very uh, efficient but it would at least allow you to represent it in a self-contained uh, way. So one file contains everything, but it, the file would become very large. But the alternative way, and that's I think probably the more useful one, is you can simply have a, a link to an external file, and that can be a LAS file. So you can say, okay, that wall geometry is represented by that LAS file. And, uh, and that's basically the way how you can link the different semantic concepts represented in CDGML to external uh, data sets. And um, we will look at, at, the, at examples. So one possibility, as I mentioned, is point clouds inline in the CDGML file. One is the, one separate external point cloud file for each city object and one external point cloud file for all city objects. So that means you have one CDGML file, one point cloud file, and different objects in the CDGML file refer to different subsets of points in your, in your laser cloud, uh, point file. And I think that's the most that's the most practical uh, approach. We have tried all of these and also come up with test data. So you can also download the test data for, for CityGML3. Um, and um, so we have done that just for demonstration purposes for an, an area of one by one kilometer. Uh, we have point cloud data uh, with roughly six points per square meter. And uh, we had a level of detail to city GML building models. That means we have roof surfaces model, wall surfaces models, ground surface model, et cetera. And we have created a simple FME workflow that basically uh, links the points with the objects. And um, that in the end gives you the, these, these representations. So the first op option is point cloud geometries in line with the city GML object. So I, it's probably difficult to read, but th here you can see uh, it's a building and the building has a property and that is called point cloud. I also need a glasses for that to really read that. Uh, so it simply says the building might have a normal geometry. So like a, like a polygon, but in, it, in addition, it can also have a point cloud. And the point cloud here is represented as really enumerating every single point, which is quite verbose. Uh, and um, so in this case, however, what you can see here is when you visualize that data set in FME, so you can directly load that data set in FME, and then you see here all these points here belong to the same uh, to the same uh, um, building. So you can click on it, and because they are represented as a multi-point, they are treated as a as an aggregate. Uh, second one was one separate external point file. So you see, it's very similar as before. I don't know. I hope you can read it. Okay. So basically you have here again, the building and then the point cloud now refers to a file, to an external file and simply says, okay, the points are given in that file. Um, and uh, you can see here, here are additional attributes, for example, uh, for the city GML building. And this I think is the most interesting solution. So you say, okay, I have one external point cloud file for all city objects, for all buildings in that area. So, and in this case, what we do is we intro include a query on the file name of the uh, of the um, of the laser point file. So we say, if in the point cloud the the there is an attribute which has an object ID. So and um, unfortunately there is no standard LAS uh, um, attribute called object ID. So we in this case we basically misuse uh, one one field. In this case we we use the point source ID. 
But of course, you can also use an other, another attribute. And we do that by simply saying, okay, the point cloud of that building, maybe one specific building here, here's the laser file. And then you see the question mark and say, um, you have to search that attribute point source ID. That's the ID attribute. And then here is, we are looking for the building with the values ID equal to one. And that allows you then to simply select all the points that have the same IDs, uh, ID value one, they are linked then with this, with this building. So, um, and that allows you, of course, afterwards to also visualize that. So um, you can also now see in just a point cloud visualization and using different colors for different, for different points. So every building that is not blue here is, uh, every point that is not blue belongs to a building and the different colors show these are different semantic, semantic objects. And um, so that's basically um, a very nice and easy way in CityGML3 to now link between semantic objects and building. And it does not only work with buildings, but with all CityGML object types. Can be used for trees, can be used for water bodies, for terrain, for whatever, what you want. So that's, uh, and that's uh, um, a, nice, a nice feature. Now the question is, when we now have this capability of bringing things together, we have also had a look at the question, how can we possibly, first of all, match point clouds with uh, semantic 3D data, or that's, that's one step. And the next step is then, of course, after we have matched, then we can, of course, also create the enriched CDGML data and say, okay, these points belong to that building part, for example. And um, so we have created a workflow to and implementing some metrics. So we need to find out when can we tell whether a point belongs to a certain city object. And we can, you can imagine different metrics, some, something like the distance uh, of the point from the surface, for example, that you, that you, that you represent. And, um, and so the idea is then you take the semantic city model and the point clouds, and then we associate uh, um, a point cloud subset with each city object. And we use different metrics for that, for that pur uh, purpose. And we have done, for example, that with point distance distribution. So we look in the displacement in direction of the surface normal. So if the surface normal, uh, the surface is here, the normal looks, looks orthogonal to this. And the question is, we want to know for each point, how far is it, first of all, is it close enough and how far is it in, in, the, in direction of the, of the surface normal uh, away from the, from the uh, object. And then we simply make a classification. So we give a certain threshold and say, if the threshold is, uh, uh, um, higher, uh, then we, we say, okay, the point is maybe outside of the, uh, so in, 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 in direction of the surface normal, or if it's in the other direction, then we say, okay, it's in, it's in the opposite direction moved. And then what we, so we, uh, we use this here with a mobile mapping laser scanner data. So this is a semantic model of a, of a building. This is a scene from Ingolstadt. Ingolstadt is in Munich, uh, not in Munich, in Bavaria. Uh, reason why we use Ingolstadt is because that's the headquarters of Audi. So, uh, um, and, um, and so what you see here is that that's the CDGML level of detail three model. So you can see the windows, you can see also balconies, et cetera. And here are, is, the, uh, is the point cloud. And um, so what we, what we did is basically we created a buffer around every, every CDGML object to simply find candidates for, for, to check. And then afterwards, uh, we, we basically, for every object here, uh, may it be a window or may it be a piece of the wall, we just then checked for the individual points and their classification. So, and if the median uh, the, uh, um, is uh, larger than five centimeters, um, um, so the, the median distance of the points we found here, then we say that surface, for that surface, we have a strong deviation. So there is obviously something has changed or something is, is significant. And so we can also uh, um, flag that city GML object and say, here is something you need to check. And um, we did that. And as you can see here, this building, that's the original building here with, that we have before on the, on the lowest uh, picture, but the point cloud reveals that there's a scaffolding around the building. So on the scaffolding in the end leads to uh, the point that we classify the surface, the city GML wall surface here as deviation. And red means it's a deviation outside. So in direction of the surface normal and um, blue means a deviation inside. So that means 
obviously uh, that that door for that balcony has been uh, is moved to the inside. What's the reason? I don't know at the moment. But what is clearly uh, what you can clearly see because we have a scaffold in front of the, of the surfaces. Most of those points here, of course, are not aligned with the with the with the surface, and that's basically talking about um, classifying this wall surface. So this semantic surface as being changed or being uh, being deviated. And that's something that you can then highlight and also analyze. You can also see from the ground surface. So we also have the roads. The roads are also represented by surfaces. So we, we know even for each driving lane, we have, a, we have a separate representation for the pedestrian walkways. These are all different semantic objects. And uh, the green ones mean that's, that's uh, completely match. So uh, that means we don't have deviations that are larger in the median from five centimeters. And uh, the red patches, however, seem to also have some changes. And uh, of course, here in this case, it, the changes might also be the reason <coughs> because of vegetation that is that is on top that was not modeled in CDG in this in this uh, data set. So um, that is an, an idea how you can make use of this kind of combination in for digital twins. So saying, okay, we need to update these objects. Maybe we can even use the point cloud and reconstruct additional geometry from that from these features. Nevertheless, we know at least very detailed, not just on a building level, but even on parts of buildings where things have changed. And um, yeah, this is also um, another example where we go, we went the other way around. So we simply have the, we have the city GML model, and we started with a city GML model, and from that model we derived a point cloud. And this is the the result of a solar irradiation analysis. So what we simply do is for every surface of the of the city, and that includes not just the building surfaces, so the vertical surfaces, the horizontal surfaces, but also um, the surfaces of the road, the surfaces of the trees, etc. So they are all basically taken, and we create a sampling on these surfaces. So the wall surface is sampled every meter. So you can you can choose what sampling distance you want to have. So we create a basically a regular grid of points. And then for each of the points, we run ray tracing algorithms to see what's the solar irradiation and what's the, uh, the direct sunlight irradiation and what's the diffuse uh, irradiation. The diffuse irradiation is the one we, we, we create an artificial hemisphere on top of uh, we create an artificial hemisphere on top of the city, and uh, we make sections in the sky, and these sky sections uh, irradiate different amounts of solar light. Um, throughout the entire day, and there are functions so you can, um, uh, that you can take from literature. So we, we so that means we we um, compute the irradiation part from this uh, hemisphere part and from the sun position that is going around uh, throughout the entire year. And that, this information is now accumulated into each point. So that means each point here is uh, accumulating the, the the global irradiation, so direct plus uh, plus diffuse irradiation. And even this is now even irradiated, I think aggregated over the entire year. But of course, we can also make other aggregations like what's daily aggregations or monthly aggregations or whatever. The nice thing is for each point, we still know to which object it belongs, to which uh, a building object and to which roof surface of which building. So that means we can take all the points that belong to one piece of a building uh, or to one piece of the roof surface and then compute what's the overall solar irradiation for that entire surface by just uh, uh, taking all these points into account. But then, of course, for visualization purposes, you might also just want to continue with this artificial point cloud. So that could also be an interesting, an interesting aspect. So yeah, coming to the end. Um, so I, I think it would be really nice to have uh, in the future more possibilities to work both with point clouds and with semantic city models and to really benefit from each other. And, and on the one side, maybe drawing some semantic information from the city model, bringing them into point clouds so that you can continue with point cloud tools. And on the other side, taking point clouds, which are likely more accru accurate, more up to date, and learn from them about uh, uh, the existing uh, semantic city models, maybe in, in terms of updates or in terms of reliability, and maybe also in understanding uh, better about uh, the surface materials that, that are being used. So, um, and that's basically 
what we what we have been working on. And I think, yeah, the trick to include point clouds in CDGMA is not so big, but I think it's uh, it's quite versatile. And um, so, yeah, I would like to encourage everybody to experiment with that in the future. And I think that would brings me to the end of the presentation. Thank you very much, Thomas. It was good to hear about this integration of the factory presentations and the point clouds with CPG on the one environment. Other questions? Okay. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is Thomas and welcome to Dubai. That's just a tiny curiosity. One way to show how you tweak the last mile. This one? Yeah. yeah. There's another curiosity. What type of infection is that all these are? Is it limited to the people? Because I assume if you have one file with a lot of CD objects. Yes. I mean, may run out of it. Yes, the, the point is actually, as I said, the, the last standard has no uh, standardized attribute for it. The last standard allows that you can extend uh, the data for points by yourself, but unfortunately, most software solutions, again, are ignoring that. So that means uh, you can basically do that, but then ArcGIS or, or other tools possibly don't know how to, to work with it. So we looked out for an attribute which would fit to it, and that's basically called point source ID, but that's just 16 bits. It means you can just have 65,000 uh, different uh, values for, for it. And, um, but we overcome this problem by stating explicitly which attribute you want to use. And so if your last file has a user-defined attribute, which can be a big int, for example, then of course you can just name it here and then use also an ID value that is associated to it. I mean, it's even, we, we don't restrict this in the standard. So we might be, you can see a little bit sloppy here, uh, but the reason is even maybe if you have a string field and you would even store the, the identifier and maybe a GML identifier here as a string, which is not very efficient, um, then this could also work in a similar way. I, I was wondering here about the performance. Yeah? So if you have uh, 10,000 uh, yeah. different uh, yeah. identities, yeah. And you want to make a display, and indeed, maybe uh, 4,000 in the view now. How, how fast will that be to, to show up on your screen that you see these? Uh, I mean, that's not that's not so so difficult. No, no, no. no, because I mean, if you if you look at this visualization, that was done with ArcGIS, so that was using ArcGIS Pro. Yeah. So we simply loaded the point cloud file and simply said, use a different color for different point source ID values, and then basically yeah, it was. Maybe the other way around that you display all points and use the ID as color. Yeah. And you're, For example, yes. Yes. If you have the previous slide, is that you kind of create by ID. Yeah. I see 10,000 times you go into the file. And it is, no, I mean, I mean, work. I mean, the, the idea, so it's not the idea that CDGML is being used here as an online representation in something like an interactive browsing tool or whatever. This is just the possibility to have, if you have a large point cloud file on the other side, you have a large city GML yeah. file and you want to, don't want to lose the information that you have gained by some processes, which, which make the, the correlation between the two files. This is now a standardized way how you can represent it. And it would be of course, up to the algorithm of the rendering, for example, to have an efficient selection yeah. method, for example. Yeah. 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 I mean, at the moment, um, um, yeah, of course. Uh, if you create the city models based on a roof print and extrapolate or make make the walls just as an as an um, um, extrapolation down vertical uh, downwards, then of course you would have a lot of deviations of that. 
But that could be also a very nice indication of that because you would get the information that this world surface is significantly, you can also get this, the histograms. So we can really can say, okay, this is in reality 10 centimeters uh, to the inside or more 10 centimeters to the outside. One possibility could be to try and simply move the surface and, and shrink the building and then afterwards see if, if the fit is better. Otherwise, of course, if, if, uh, if the facade has a lot of details like balconies, et cetera, then of course things become, become more difficult. But of course, what you could do is you can then do a segmentation of the deviation information and say, okay, I will split the wall surface into certain areas. Some are more, uh, more extruded outwards, some are maybe more extruded inwards. So that's, but that, that's basically not something that we are looking at, but we would just want to give the possibility for people who are working on these things to represent that knowledge. You mean for 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 sand dunes and at, at the at the sea? I mean, I think we don't at the moment have a have a model for for modeling dunes explicitly. So there's no semantic model for for dune. But what you can do is uh, you can think about representing a dune. One could be as a as a terrain, as a piece of the terrain. So uh, um, um, I mean, it's the, the dune surface is is part of the terrain. So that that means you can use the city geomer class terrain. Uh, so relief uh, um, uh, or tin relief, for example, if you would represent it by a tin, and then you can also have, in addition, the point cloud representation for it. That's still possible. So, and then you can also make this kind of variation calculation if you want. Infrastructure, mean pipelines. And, uh, I didn't get it. So, uh, bridge. ah, bridges. Yeah, of course. CityGemma has also all these kind of features, like bridges, tunnels. They are all included. So, it also would work in the same in the same way. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it's um, in the end, basically, we are using the point clouds in order to reduce the data uh, size. And at the moment, this entire process is not running on GPUs, but it simply it should be running on GPUs. Yeah. But we don't have programmers for GPUs, so that means we, we have to basically find ways how we can implement it um, in a in a way. So at the moment, this is a it's completely implemented as a Java program. So uh, and so. Um, Doing the solar irradiation computation for Munich really runs a couple of hours until, until it's, it's finished. But still, um, every it's still point, fast. It's, it's still fast. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a highly parallel. So the entire process has been parallelized. So we can even run it on a bunch of computers. So it will even create Docker instances of the computing process, etc. So it's really spreading that. It, it simply is, we, we have, I have no PhD students which are basically working on, on using GPUs. And, um, so that's, that's the, that's the limitation. If you would have, if you we would have people who would directly use uh, uh, triangles using a GPU to to, to um, est uh, estimate the, the visibility, of course, then it would be much faster. Yeah. Let me continue on that one. Uh, we are using a object-based representation, mm -hmm. and we are using GPU. Mm -hmm. We did like city, let's say that the entire is done within seconds mm -hmm. for this. Yeah. Energy okay. I mean, the question is, um, do you also, I mean, um, do you also include things like diffuse irradiation? Do you also include or just direct irradiation? I mean, uh, that's that's also a question. And, um, and another question is, uh, what we also do is a calibration. So the data is calibrated for every point on Earth. We are using data from NASA for, for that purpose. So, and we have made validations of the estimated um, irradiation values in kilowatt hours. 
against measured data from periodometers, and we are just a couple of percent away. So it's uh, it's quite precise and uh, uh, or accurate. Uh, it's quite accurate, and, um, and that's uh, yeah. yeah. It's, we are considering, I mean, the sun, the day of the yeah. hour, every all those things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, but how do you relate the data back to the to the objects? Is is is, is that an external file then, or is that um, is that something because that's also something that we are of course interested in CDG you know, to have these numbers like the solar radiation values with the time series can now be represented as time series attributes of the object itself so it's embedded into the object itself yeah. in our case it's not embedded but mm -hmm. we put it for all day and the, the okay. it so you're linked so you're linking that's right that's, that's, that's okay mm -hmm. because we have hundreds of analysis like this right. yes by the way, it's very nice to see a conversion from, say, a vector model to a point cloud. Uh, in the theory, I always included it to be complete, uh, the arrow yeah. in both directions. Yeah. But it's nice to see one application that is useful uh, going in the direction from the vector model to, to point yes. cloud. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Can I ask a question about it? Please. Yeah. Could you be also that you are also triple 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 Two, okay. Yeah, because they say that the the vector models are derived from and that is in the wasn't it? Oh, sorry, it is over there that the email models are derived from the post cloud and yep. also in the get over there. And, uh, yeah. The business models are uh, from taking from post cloud. Yeah. So there is one moment in time that the algorithm has access to the phone cloud mm -hmm. and thinks okay. And that was on whatever they were thinking, okay, it's going together, and this is the kind of thing. Yeah. That moment is like this. Yeah. And the thing to be that in all kind of that 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 knowledge that we lost. So they do know okay now the space, and they throw away the phone cloud, and they do yeah. the and then you yes. come back to the site of Yes. And then you have to come back, okay, now the space, which one is going to do that? Yes. Why is it better that the software keep those remember? Yes, of course, of course. But in the past, it was not possible basically to represent this information. Yeah, in but the... of course, it's possible. If you do know that, that of course, but uh, if you do know which one is going to obey, then you. Yeah, but then you have an extra you have an extra file or whatever. Yeah, yeah, so it needs okay. that's the semantics of or meaning. Of, of a vendor yeah. that that makes this file, which typically then gets lost during translate trans, transporting yeah. to to and a user, etc. And I'm quite keen because I have mm -hmm. uh, attended uh, the last couple of cases with uh, phone cloud domain or infrastructure of mm -hmm. of yeah. and in each of them there were particular companies. Yes, we move phone cloud. Hey, yes, we right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 It, and then the yeah, but it often it often depends on the customer because the customer typically, for example, we have we have this company in, in, in near to Munich. There's a company called uh, uh, 3D Mapping Solutions, and they are basically also generating point clouds, especially for the automotive industry. And they the automotive industry is just interested in the open drive data. They do not want to have terabytes of point clouds. So in the end, also what they what they ask for is the delivery of that of that data. Okay, I understand. But then if you have project size in fifteen, there you are. The first step is those allocate which point you want to use the service. Yeah, I mean the company the company should have this information, but they are not receiving extra money to uh, or or getting extra money for de delivering that data. To the customer sometimes also the customer cannot deal with this huge amount of yeah, but maybe in the future open drive of course zero and oh. uh, instead of the of course with ugly trees you get real trees from point clouds so really super realistic yes yes and yeah uh, yes okay it's bigger but okay yeah we can transfer it in uh, yeah and uh, if you know it's from here because i realize it's a mess and also about the mental that is kind of way that you have to Stay in your in the model of okay, yeah. But we are human beings and we are quite capable in staying in the phone. Okay, I see this one better. Yeah, 
yeah. For, for humans. But that's in, inside your brain. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that you have in your brain and by looking at data immediately making interpretations of what you of what you see is something that the computer cannot replicate no, at least not yet but so it, it means it means basically um, um, uh, this this information needs to be needs to be so you need to have an algorithm which which does the interpretation yeah. and say okay I have reconstructed the tree and the tree is also that tree reconstruction is coming maybe from that subset of the point cloud. I, yeah, I think that's also the fundamental that image from the right. Yeah. Across, if you ask people where you're in the building, then the effective architecture, they will have countless ways of expressing the basis of building in a way that they're expressing one thing that they can all build or whatever. And they know what this is about. By only expressing functions, yeah, but it always requires a human. So if you want to hire, operate on fifty thousand buildings in a, in, a, in a city, and making, for example, energetic assessments or, or something like that, or you want to know um, um, other, yeah, some other functionalities, then this doesn't help. So I mean, um, meshes and point clouds are very well for human reception, also for, for visualization, because you see so many details in there. And so um, that's also the reason why, of course, uh, Google uses mesh models because they are cheap to produce. I have a high um, 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 recon recognition. And also Bentley, for example, is, is, uh, is doing a similar thing with, with a re reality maps product. But this is mostly for manual interaction, which is good, which is an important part, but it's, it's, um, it's severely limited re re regarding the representation, uh, the automatic, um, and then they tell you the results together. Yeah? So yeah. if you want to do it automatically, yeah. you use this representation. If you want, yeah. that can also yeah. be yeah. yes. cloud. Yes. You know the ID. Uh, yes. the so, so the idea was really to say, let's lay the foundations so that we can make these links between those two worlds. And everybody is invited to think about algorithms, about applications on exploiting that. That's basically the... We are really a little bit out of time. Yeah. So, I, yeah. Vitaly, you had a question? Yeah, uh, very good question. You, um, when you are uh, in the edge of your phone tab, uh, let's say IT, yeah. we are using um, some algorithms, some data for assigning the number of just character. I'm, I'm asking that, for instance, because when you are querying yeah. this uh, file, they meet some number of logs together, but yeah. Yeah. At the moment, we don't have any specific number. We simply count up. So you simply say, okay, we, we just take the first uh, surface uh, of the city model that we want to match against the points. We determine all the points, and that these points get number one. And then we take the next one, and etc. So the, the objects in the city geo file have also an identifier, but that's typically a string, and that string is typically twelve. 15, 16 characters long because it's a UUID. So it's a it's a uniform uh, at a, at a unique, uh, globally unique identifier. And you don't want to assign to 10 or 20 million points that long string. So that's basically um, also the, the idea to use this. Okay, I'd like to thank so much yeah. for the nice presentation. Yeah. And also with a small, short, uh, don't too, too quick. And now let's quickly move to the second presentation uh, that will be given by Rob Thompson from uh, Australia. He was also in the committee uh, this morning. And we now move to the legal spaces, land administration, 
and especially if you're dealing with large volumes of data, uh, how to make sure that we have still uh, yeah, good performance. Rob, please go ahead. Um, first of all, I've got to apologize in, in a way because um, nothing that I'm presenting now is new. Uh, this um, It's kind of a review of some old technology. It's, um, it's a new presentation, but um, the technology itself is in some cases more than 20 years old. Um, but it occurred to me that since a lot of these, this technology is not currently being used, it's probably a good time to look at it again and to see if um, there's some techniques there that could be used. Um, so first of all, I wanted to talk about how cadastral data is different from other data. The first question is different from what? It's not the same as classic GIS coverages, land cover, etc. It's not the same as a collection of features uh, because a lot of the, um, for example, flooded areas, uh, bushfire threats, things like that. And it's not the same as a collection of networks. So I wanted to sort of um, say what it is, what makes it unique. Um, first of all, it, it does make a complete coverage. So in, in that way, it's a bit like GIS. There are no gaps permitted. You do have to define, you have to account for all land uh, right down to the millimeter, even though um, it doesn't mean terribly much. There's a parcel visible in this picture here, which is 15 millimeters wide at its widest point. And the um, land administration people do get worried about that size of parcel. They go to the trouble of producing a plan to make it clear. But then again, some authorities leave the roads and rail links and things out of the cadastro and they just leave them as holes. So then even the, the rule that they have to cover all, all, all the land doesn't always apply. Um, one of the significant features about cadastro is that um, it's possible to define a base layer, which um, is the sort of complete coverage, hopefully. Uh, if you, if, yeah, that all, all has to be defined. Uh, and um, it has to not overlap the base layer because two people can't expect to have the same piece of land. But that's rarely how it works out in practice. Um, it also deals with groupings. And this is uh, another area where it's similar to GIS data. You combine um, a series of land spatial units to form things like suburbs, towns, local government areas, electoral districts. That's a very, very much classic GIS approach. But, um, uh, and it's also fairly common to have um, labeling points on your spatial units which uh, we always usually call centroids, but they're not, they're not uh, math mathematical centroids. So for a start, we've got a combination of area features and point features. One of the critical things about these labeling points is they do have to be inside the parcel, inside the spatial unit. Otherwise things get very confusing. So that's um, on top of that, it then starts getting a bit more complicated in that we have um, possibly overlapping secondary in, in interests in land parcels. And it contains 3D objects, which sometimes are within a base parcel and sometimes are not and so forth. Um, but both of these, the um, non-base, secondary interests and the 3D objects should be treated in the same way by the land administration. Uh, the fact that something is a 3D parcel, it still gets uh, rented, owned, sold. And the other big thing about it, 
Um, cadastral data is very strongly associated with um, house addressing. Um, and house addressing is something very important to everybody. Now here's our address and I've just divided it up into um, different groupings. So going from the bottom up, Brisbane is uh, an area, it's a town, and it can be defined as a whole collection of spatial objects, uh, of um, spatial units. Queensland, likewise, is an area which also can be defined as being a number of spatial units. Um, the postcode is also a collection of spatial units. Kangaroo Point, the um, suburb, is again a collection. Um, and Saltstone Street is a road and it's a collection. And on top of that, these days in Australia, we do have this concept of the um, uh, original language groups, the uh, native title area. And that's um, defined as a, an area in space rather than spatial units. But one of the critical things about all these combinations is they, they're not hierarchical. For example, uh, the, uh, along the edge of a um, suburb, you get these strange notches there. And that's because it's allowable for when land is being sold for the uh, real estate people to indicate that it belongs to this suburb rather than that suburb. Um, the land is worth more if it's in Kangaroo Point than it is in East Brisbane, for example. So you get these strange things there that don't show in the um, postcode area and don't show in the um, even Brisbane itself. Uh, but the point is, I suppose, that the house address is very critical to spatial units. Now, um, of course, like everything else, I suppose, point clouds do have a point of a part to play in cadastral data. Uh, I don't think we're making as much use of them in Queensland as we should, but um, anyway, I think it'll come on. Uh, it's important in a survey plan to know the altitude above sea level because vertical lines get further apart, higher up. So you need to know roughly how high they are. And it turns out that in our databases, we don't have a good strong reference height on every parcel. So just as a quick way of finding a rough height. Um, locating a parcel boundary, it, um, there are large areas in, in Queensland, but I'm sure it applies throughout the world, large areas that have never been surveyed. An area has been um, divided up according to um, agreements. And um, the actual position, the definition of the land really depends on the first person who went through there and banged pole of pegs into the ground without any reference. So knowing where a fence line is in some of these places is very important. So using a, a classic point cloud um, processing technique, finding local ground level, moving about half a meter above it and finding the points there, you'll find you've got a line of fence posts. And when you see those in a roughly equally spaced, you can uh, actually identify a fence line and another fence line and there you've got a property boundary. Uh, it's, though it, it works in terms of um, a hierarchy of um, evidence. And if somebody has been running cattle on a property for the last hundred years and nobody has complained that the fence is in the wrong place, it becomes a prima facie proof that that person owns that property. Um, so 
not quite the same as in the city where you can argue your 15 millimeters. But that's, that's a very important part, which I think will a lot more uh, use will be made. Locating a building within a spatial unit, often buildings not so much in Queensland, but around the world, the corner of a building can be used as a reference point to define um, uh, meets and bounds of parcels that surround it. Uh, if the building has been there for 500 years or something, it's a fairly good monument. Um, but the other way around, locating a spatial unit within a building, well, of course, that's where the whole uh, point cloud um, uh, use for finding, um, uh, you know, for converting to uh, building unit plans. Um, and also, of course, the comparison between land use codes and actual vegetation to see what really is there compared to what is supposed to be there. Okay, um, but what I really wanted to talk about was the spatial indexing, because I feel that um, CADASTA particularly has got different requirements of spatial indexing than most of the other forms of um, spatial data. Um, same as in other cases, it must be to be a spatial index, it must be at least two dimensions. And the critical thing is that X is not more important than Y. You've got two equal dimensions. You may have three, you may not, but certainly it's gonna be at least two dimensional. And it must, um, generally speaking, accommodate extended objects. So point clouds are the exception. Everything else kind of is, um, dealing with spatial objects. And certainly this is true of Cadaster. <clears throat> but there are some other strange um, characteristics. Firstly, it really is for Cadaster only 2D in terms of indexing, because in a, an X or a Y direction, you could be looking at 2000 spatial units um, from one side of the database to the other, or 2000 kilometers. From the Z direction, you could be looking at 200, uh, or oh, 100, I've said, 100 spatial units and a few hundred meters. Um, if you did a two dimensional search and then looked at everything in that column, you probably do just as well as if you did a three dimensional search. Um, and likewise, the time dimension, even with a full history, you've probably only got a few hundred historical records for a cadastral parcel. So it simplifies the problem if you can think of it as 2D. The other critical one is the size difference of um, cadaster. Now, if you look, the one on the left is a typical suburban area, and you see these throughout the world. Their parcels are all around about the same size, about 30 meters. Um, I, talk about the linear di dimension of them because there are thin ones, you know, wider ones and so forth, but linearly they're about 30 meters. Um, and there will be thousands of them. Then you move a bit further out and you get similar sort of parcels, uh, sorry, spatial units, but the size, typical size goes to about four kilometers. And then you move further out and you've got spatial unit sizes of 26 kilometers. So you have a million or so of the suburban ones in a, one of the rural ones, and they do group. You'll have areas that are um, suburban, and then you have a sort of a rough boundary, and then you have um, the broader ones, and then you have a rough boundary, and then you get the really wide ones. There's no clear one. It's not a, nobody has drawn a line on the map and said this size, this size. But you certainly do have um, a case of moving. Now, um, indexing strategies, we've been talking quite a bit today about uh, false positives in doing searches. Typically, what you do is um, you have a database, 
you want to find all the uh, spatial units in a particular area, so you have a um, region, a search region, you go to the database and you find all the parcels that could possibly contact that spatial region. And then you go through and look at them in turn, turn and decide which ones really do contact the area. Now, the false positives are the ones you pull back from the database and you went to all this trouble of um, getting them, and that's quite expensive, and then just throw away. So um, most cases work on bounding rectangles. So that um, if we're looking for this sort of horn colored region here, um, we'll go to the database and find all the spatial objects whose bounding rectangles um, come in contact with the bounding rectangle of the area you're searching. So that, for example, you won't pull out the red one. The bounding rectangles don't cover. The yellow ones, you will, and then you'll throw them away. They're false positives. But you do have to be sure of getting the green ones in the first level. So um, that's just a background on um, it's my contention that they can be a real problem using archery techniques. Archery gets used all the time these days, but I suspect it's basically because um, it's there, it's easy to implement. Um, it doesn't go too badly at any time. It's fairly basic, but um, it's my contention that we'd never get rid of false positives, but um, we want to try to reduce, reduce them as far as possible. Now, this, the places where it come, becomes unpleasant is a place like Longreach, which is sort of like a city. It's got a lot of very small parcels in it, but the area around it has got very large parcels. And so every time you search for these houses up here, the, the, it's going to pull in, in the first layer, it's going to pull in these large, um, the, the bounding rectangles around these large parcels that are just out of town. Um, an extreme example, um, while it's still there, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park, theoretically that's one parcel. Its minimum bounding rectangle covers about five cities. So if we had a, a, um, a simple system which said, find the minimum bounding rectangle of the um, Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. Now find me all the parcels that are within a half a kilometre of it. Our false positives would cover about six or seven cities. Uh, so. Obviously, you wouldn't do that. You'd do something special like breaking up the park into small sections and search on them. But that's um, another step. So there are two types, to my way of thinking, there are two types of spatial index. There's the ones which have a straight index entry and a spatial unit within it. And then there are the ones that have got an index entry, a spatial unit with an intermediate entry between them. The first type, like the R tree and the field tree, the minimum, the sorry, the indexing object, which is usually a, a bounding rectangle, contain the spatial unit is contained within one only um, bounding rectangle. The second one, where the um, there's an intermediate entry, you choose a particular size of rectangle and you index the item on every, every rectangle <coughs> that it falls within. So the, the rectangle there in the bottom corner falls within one index, that makes index very This one falls within two and that one falls within three. So you've got a, a more complex system and more searching involved. involved. Um, the archery itself, I, I believe, does suffer quite badly 
from the MBR issue. You've got to do a lot of work to try to set up a cadastral database that works reasonably well um, using an R tree. The field tree is a, a very interesting idea. I haven't looked at this in a lot of detail, but it gets around a lot of the problems um, by uh, arranging. It, it's based on the idea of a um, uh, uh, a binary binary tree, but it it moves off by half a unit each time, and it's got the ability to limit the size of a rectangle that you the size of a square that you have to choose to cover your spatial unit. Um, I'll come back to that, but. Um, but it does still index on a minimum bounding rectangle, but you don't need to do the whole area. On the other direction, a very old system was the um, grid file. I think Oracle used this in some of their early spatial data. They simply divided the whole area up into rectangles and indexed things depending on which ones they fell on. But it doesn't work for cadastro. They did work then on a dual size grid so that you could, large areas could go into one grid and small ones into another. And there was a system called the um, oversized shelves method of storing. But um, what I really want to talk about is the one that we worked, worked on in Queensland. Um, this and the reason I'm bringing this up today is that it's um, very closely related to the work that Hai Cheng was doing um, on the, um, the field, the, uh, what's he call it? The, um, the first the level index the anyway. Hmm? Hist the yeah, the history area, yes. Um, basically it builds a quad tree based on first cut through the database and it just subdivides the quad tree down until there are n um, reference points uh, parcel reference points in each win each index level so it, in the cities there'll be a lot more index levels than there are out in the, the districts in the and even um, the regional areas. Um, in the same way as the uh, in the same way as the history, it's based on the Morton encoding. But the difference probably with this is it's not used as an index. It's only used to generate these rectangles, these squares, just the size of the squares. Then that's kept as a uh, separate file and just used to um, to do the indexing. So it's not surprising because all it is is effectively when you analyze it, it's the history that um, Ho Cheng was talking about, but based on a very small point cloud, just the uh, parcel reference points that we use, what we call the centroids. And so it's very close in that, but it only generates the square sizes and they're the only things kept from the operation, the square sizes and the number of reference points inside each one. And it's definitely not dynamic, uh, which is um, a thing that needs to be questioned because I'm wondering now, can it be modified in the way that uh, Hai Cheng did indicate that um, the history could be done and could be brought back and actually um, modified and made more made a dynamic system. It wasn't a problem that it was not dynamic because we just regenerated. We only had to do that about once a year. It still worked very very fast. So the to extract a region using this approach, you just simply have three primitive operations. One is to find the grid square that a particular point is falls in. 
Another one is to find all the grid squares overlapping a polygon. Another one is to find all the grid squares overlapping a disk. But all of this is done before you touch the database. You've got your region and you simply find the grid squares. But when you've done that, you've got a quite a good estimate of the number of parcels you're going to bring back, the number of spatial units you're going to get back. It's about n times the number of grid squares that you've extracted. So you've got to, we, we had a very quick way of deciding. We used to put out a message, large region, are you sure? If you said yes, it would fire the request back again, but to a different server. It would put you on a low, a low priority list, which was very nice. Um, so, for example, to pull in a, a region like a triangle, but buffered around it, you would find all the grid squares, the appropriate size grid squares that match the that overlap the triangle, then you would find all the grid squares that overlap all the uh, buffers, uh, rectangular areas around the triangle. And then you'd find all the grid squares that overlap the circles. So this one down in the corner only comes in at this level. Having done all that, you just take those to the database and find the um, so, simply, um, I won't go through this in detail, but um, there are now two types of um, false positives, though. That's the, one of the catches. When we're going through the list of grid squares, every time we find a grid square we've already got, we ignore it. So that's a false positive that we've immediately thrown away. We don't have to go to the database for that though. The second time to process a particular grid square, uh, so we were looking at the large square, we can pull back a spatial unit in there that was also in the grid square beside it because they can be in multiple areas. So that's... Um, done at the intermediate level. So when we're going to the that intermediate file between the two, um, between the index and the data, um, we have to get it back from the index, but we don't have to get the data back. So that's the second form of, um, well, that's the real, um, that's a real um, false positive. But then again, with the Finally, when we pull back a spatial unit, we have to then compare it and do a rigorous test to see whether it's real or not. So you can get the disadvantage. Program has to read the histogram file, but for the whole of Queensland, several, about 4 million parcels, it was 57K, so that's not a great problem. Um, the histogram is static. It has to be regenerated. It turned out to be very insensitive to how old the, the um, index was because parcels, the regions don't change from country regions to city overnight. Um, and if you finish up with hundreds of parcels where you expected 30, it still doesn't slow down too badly. So it turned out just by trial and error that once a year was plenty to redo it. Question, of course, though, is can the ranges be approached to make it more dynamic? And one of the, I feel that it probably is possible. Uh, there's an intermediate index, which is um, a little bit of extra storage. It uses a Morton code. And there are the three types of false positives. The first ones that don't go to the database, and then the two types that do. But the advantages, it is very, very fast. <laughs> uh, we, were, we initially um, implemented it on a, does anyone remember the term MIPS, million instructions per second? It's gone out of action a long time ago. We had a three MIPS machine supporting the whole department. 
Um, that's three, what's that about? A couple of thousand times slower than anything you could buy on the market these days if you went looking. Um, so it really was very good. Uh, the first two types of false positives don't really amount to much in terms of access time. And the third one, the nice thing about it, it's limited, it's related, um, it's to the number of spatial units you're probably going to re return. You're never going to get one of these situations where I'm looking at this region because I want this large uh, spatial unit here, but I've caught the city of Townsville and I'm gonna get all of those in and remove them. It's, there's almost a proportionality between the total number of um, false positives and the total number of real positives, which is very nice. Um, it seems to scale very well, according to the number of spatial units in the region. It would be very nice to do some research on it to find out if that's true. And it does this very fast workable rough but workable uh, estimate of the number of spatial units you're going to get. It won't be right, but it'll be, it'll be within a factor of about 10. So if, if you can say to your user, um, this is going to take a while, do you want to continue? Or this is going to take a long while, do you want to continue? You can make the decision at that level. And then you can put them onto a lower priority as well. And it's also surprisingly not badly affected by the histogram being out of date. So what I'm saying, I suppose, is the artery is not everything. And if we're talking cadastre, there are probably two different, different approaches that um, could probably do the job a lot better than artery because of the, the particular um, characteristics of spatial, of, cadastral data, um, both the field tree and the what I call the tree-based grid, I'd probably retitle that now. Um, it's probably worth investigating the approaches um, and the some of the techniques in the Queensland DCDB were worth re revisiting. It's not being used anymore now, so it's open to um, open to investigation, I feel. Uh, the combination of spatial clustering and indexing is a really big one. And one of the nice things about the um, technique, this particular technique, is it does lend itself to clustering of where the data is stored. Uh, we developed it using Ingress, which has the ability to structure the data according to uh, an index. So it's a bit like the Oracle's index or organized data. And that means that the link between the intermediate table and the data table is very good. Uh, and it would be very nice, I feel, to provide some sort of guidelines on this sort of topic. So. So, any uh, thank you very much. Oh. Any questions? Okay. Yeah. So, thank you very much for the interesting uh, insights in how to do this uh, um, thing. Um, I was wondering because we go from the index at the point where we basically say okay, you can then partial it in that five point, mm -hmm. um, and then you have this. Uh, what we find with the presentation, and you try to find the overlap of points, which then are like a proxy for your exact spatial unit. How do you want to miss spatial units because of the, 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 the mapping to the point? No. Because, it, because the, the, the parts can be a bit larger, so you want to, if you just approximate them with just a point, mm. can it be in a neighboring grid style that you're not very good? No, it doesn't doesn't work that way because the um, <clears throat> talking back in terms of the index, the index itself that it builds, um, the uh, it it's simply subdividing that until you get we actually chose thirty, 
actually to get no more than 30 centroids in that region. Having done that, we just record the size of the box everywhere over Queensland. We don't actually record the position of the centroids, which ones they are, or anything like that. We just say, in Queensland at this place, the size is so much. And in this particular one, we've got so many centroids. But when it comes to actually doing the search, the parcels themselves, the, uh, I keep going back to this because I should say spatial units. The spatial units themselves are split according to which of these index boxes they fall in. And so particularly particular box index, so particular spatial units will go across an index boundary and they'll be recorded in both of those. So when you actually do a search, you take your, divide it into index boxes and then you go to the database and find the, the spatial units that cross those boxes. So yeah, the, the centroids are only used to generate the sizes because they're a pretty good indicator if you've got 30 centroids in an area, you know you've got quite a few parcels there. If you've got 500, then you know you've got to chop it down. But the. Are there any additional staff rates here? Yes. Mm. Yeah. Sorry, I should have made that a bit clearer. Yes. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. I think. I have two questions. What, what, how many parcels do you have in uh, uh, Dubai and uh, Queensland in general? So my, my question is: Is that a problem that is still relevant today? Because we have so many computers with huge amount of pain memory and, and, and something like that. That maybe this methods. I, I, I could assume in the billion of points that we have to have special special treatment. So we would have. Millions of polygons today, I won't even care maybe about, about much. That's, that's maybe the first question. Yes. Um, well, I don't know. Uh, the, the issue really with we're, we're talking about you know, 10, 10 to 20 million parcels, um, it also builds up over time because we don't delete any, it's mm -hmm. just create new history. Um, I suppose the proof of the pudding <laughs> is that um, if you do a search on uh, Queensland Cadastre, you find it is frighteningly slow <laughs> uh, now, which it used to be frighteningly fast. Uh, yes, um, I don't know. It seems to me, particularly when you've got something like a um, system that's serving thousands of users you want to get your actual access speed down to a very short time um, typically um, a thousandth of a second sorry uh, for a thousand uses a thousandth of a second should be the time the service so should so run. There's still today also a central system that's distributed the local js uh, not very much no yeah. no um, so you say your local system is slow, not because of uh, so many users in parallel, but because the system is it's slow. slow. <laughs> <laughs> I think so, because I can't see that there are going to be a large number of people. I mean, when I was developing the slides um, around the Rockhampton area, I chose that because it's um, it's got this nice, it's a city area but it's surrounded by very large rural properties. Um, it was taking, I was getting very frustrated. <laughs> it was, yes, I was, um, it was timing out a lot of the time and not giving me a, a clue. Chicken Smith, another question. You made it at the beginning of your presentation, you said that basically canister is mostly two-dimensional. I would say with the advent of 3D telescopes, I think this might really change because when you look today at, at big BIM projects, one BIM plan can be 40 gigabytes. One building is mostly extending vertically. 
So it, it, it means that we, uh, I, I think probably it will become become much more important to also have the third dimension. Oh yes. I, I wasn't saying that it's a two-dimensional problem because I've spent most of my time in the last well, 20, 10 years or so talking about 3D cadaster. Okay, and then maybe I got, I got the message wrong. That was, no, it was purely the indexing side. Yeah, but um, I think also the, yeah, yeah, I was referring to that. So it's also the indexing, I think, will become more important on the, on the third dimension. Maybe, but I still think most people say, find me this building and then find me where I am in the building rather than saying, look through Queensland yeah. at an area uh, 10 yeah, meters above the ground. Yeah, it's sort of, yeah. Okay, so yeah. Yeah, yeah it's sort of, there's, there's a, an asymmetry about it. <laughs> you, um, if you're talking about a, a watch, uh, a, a plan of a watch, you can look at it as that, that's the top or that's the top. For the building, that's the top always. <laughs> it's got one direction. You can walk around and look at it from different angles, but it, yeah, it is yeah, probably yeah, wrong to say. When you search an entire um, area or country, then of course yeah. then you, will, like, you will probably not search for the 22nd story throughout the country. Throughout the country. Yeah. That's yeah. Possible. It's probably wrong though to say that it's a two dimensional problem. Oh, yeah, instance, I would say three-dimensional index is then becoming interesting when you have identified the building. Right? Yes. Because the data is becoming more so complex. That, that, that uh, because I could imagine a problem uh, knowing that we're in um, central central area of Brisbane. Show me a slice through Brisbane to see what people looking out a window can see. And that's really a 3D search. And likewise, the time as well. Uh, at the moment, because there's not so much history, um, you find the parcels you want, and then you run backwards and forwards through the history to see see what you want. It might be that people will want to say, "Show me Brisbane in 1960," um, and so they they can do a a 4D search on it or 3D search or something like that. Yeah. Hmm. Now, our approach in one country was to use the centroid. Oh, yes. Latitude, longitude, and height. Latitude, longitude, to cancel seconds. And in case it is outside, let's say, the polygon, we were pushing and registering the offset inside the polygon. That way, it is so fast, so easy, simplified the search and use of, let's say, that addressing the land and the parts and so on. Oh, yes. So we are using nationally. Oh, okay. Um, how do you get on uh, in a case like uh, when we're looking at um, the corner of uh, Longreach uh, and you've got this giant parcel and its centroid is uh, 30 kilometers. That's what away. I said. I mean, that's an object. 98% already inside. Yes. Then for 2%, we are pushing until it be a close inside the object. Okay, that's, yeah, that's fine. And, and you can also have the problem that you, um, you're you looking at a region and there's no no centroid in there. We, we did work with, at one stage, the idea of getting all the parcels whose centroids are in the region, and then looking across the boundary to fill in the rest. But then we ran up against this problem of you bring up a region and there are no centroids there, so you've got no boundaries to cross. Uh, but if you if you just extend, that would solve that. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so it, it seems like quite a reasonable way of working it. It's very easy to search and to access it in this instance. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Well, I was wondering uh, in your uh, cells uh, they have objects that are on the boundary and they are the not positive grid cells uh, which is then not nice especially if it's really happening often so how often is that happening is that an exception that you are on the boundary uh, yes. did you do any tuning so the, the number of centroid is 30 mm. relatively low number still so 
I expect a lot of objects will yes. be on the boundary having multiple references. Yes, um, it was always a bit of a pity. We tried it out on the first day at 30 and it worked, so we never never did any more <laughs> tuning. Yeah. Uh, typically, it seemed that we got about five to 10% of the parcels in a region would be hit a second time. So it wasn't a great problem. Um, obviously, if you've got one of these cases where well, one of the problems with splitting is, okay, the maximum is 30, but the minimum could be two. You could split yep. badly. And so you'll have some areas where you have very few initial parcels and those ones are going to be crossing multiple boundaries anyway. So it varies a lot, but as I said, the, it worked, so we left it alone. <laughs> yeah. It was, yeah. And when you did this uh, annual reorganization, you had to rebuild the, the whole structure. The whole structure, because yes. Maybe before it was one big cell, and it belonged to that cell number. And if you split a cell, yeah. uh, I was always thinking, should we go back and try to split cells dynamically? But that means every parcel that is indexed on that cell size in that area has to be re-indexed as well. Yeah, it could be, it could be done. It could be done, but um, it degraded so slowly. Uh, in fact, yeah. we had to insist on them doing it every year because otherwise they lost the programs to do it. Yeah. You know, they, they have to run it on a regular basis. Otherwise, uh, they'll be searching around and the programs won't work anymore. Okay, I think we are really running into the time of the break. If there are no more urgent questions, I would like to thank Rod one more time. Well, it's a small present. Thank you. And yeah, then we now have a break until uh, half past uh, three, and then we uh, continue with the second half of the presentations. I will put the Slide stuff here. Thank you. 
Ja, update it. I have a, yeah, yeah.
It's ready. I also have the power for money. No, this will 
afternoon everybody it's really a great pleasure it's my honor to be here in front of such distinguished people i hope my presentation uh, will give you a good idea between i would say r d people and uh, industry so i'm trying to we are trying to be in three places including being bridge between them now i will cover this topic a little bit our uh, companies and then digital twins the way i we understood and so on because people uh, dr thomas talk about mesh model uh, point cloud and other things i will go more to semantic models and the uh, object based presentation that's uh, probably more applicable for uh, beam integration cadaster and so on then I will go to in integrated workflow using building information managed, 3D cadaster land management, as everybody said. Even I say 4D cadaster, the time should be an element there as well. And joint project with MIT and Delft University. I'll go over just in, uh, to share where also we can work hopefully uh, together uh, to those projects. Then digital transformation, AR, VR, and metaverse, something we are very seriously working on it. And uh, after 10 days, I will have the, with some people there in the board of metaverse and so on. And plus, uh, we'll, we have discussion with Unity. And tomorrow, I will be in Paris with Thales and uh, Dissolt. They are pretty good in this. ARBR and uh, so on. Then uh, I will uh, uh, share with you our potential digital twin beam projects and so on. They are really very sizable, important projects. Mid-map technology. By the way, I am retired from UN. I used to work for the United Nations. And 25 years experience, more than 200 people in different, uh, mainly in the uh, Middle East and Turkey. And uh, our specialization is really geometrics engineering from all the way from geotechnic engineering to mapping GIS and LIS. Uh, by the way, I mean, we established the geodetic network of Saudi Arabia, cores of Turkey and cores of uh, Saudi Arabia. And uh, at the moment, I am in the board in uh, Kazakhstan to establish course and uh, geo it for Kazakhstan. And uh, then, but uh, our main strength comes from digital twin and smart cities. We'll see that a little bit later. And uh, at the top of those, uh, let's say, our digital twin, we have hundreds of different applications, analysis, and so on. We are one of the 15 Esri Platinum partners. I will explain. I mean, uh, the digital twin technology, gaming technology, we had, we, it was acquired by Esri last year, and it will be part of Arcis Pro. Already, it is part of, uh, I will say, uh, 3DS uh, Esri uh, with Unity. It is also part of that one. 
Uh, now, uh, we have also a specialty artist system, artist indoor, and also I'm in the board of a, a consortium in the land, water, air, MIT. And we, are, we have joint projects, especially in developing countries. Digital twins, everybody that I mentioned, is it, really virtual representation of the real earth. It's dynamic, it's not 3D models. It is living, uh, I say, many people misunderstand that. And um, it, that's the reason it goes from 3D modeling to beam, GIS, and everything. But the good thing is that we are using digital twins. Uh, you will see some examples for uh, proper planning, smart cities, smart buildings, and so on. So uh, there is a huge, uh, I would say, uh, uh, contribution from digital to win, especially now in our projects, we are trying to bring all the uh, geospatial users uh, uh, using digital to win as a common uh, foundation. And uh, that idea is very well, uh, received by those people. Generation of digital twins, I'll give a little bit explanation here because we have a really a, a 90, 95% automation. For example, we just flew Jetta, 2,400 square kilometer, five and seven and a half centimeter GSD. And uh, flight just finished, we'll finish the entire digital twin of Jetta in uh, four to six months. And Singapore is one quarter of Jetta. It took them three years and $73 million. And in my case, also the cost less than 10%. So, but uh, for that, uh, we had this meetups with Sol to Esri. Uh, it was the next generation mapping. It, it was coming from gaming, technology, Unity, Unreal, and so on. Uh, a powerful one uh, using a lot of artificial intelligence. Uh, just to give you a simple example, uh, to great extent, we can create roof prints and footprints. So that's very important. And uh, also uh, automated DSM, DTM, and so on to a greater extent. Plus, photos are created almost 100% automatically. I mean, that's the beauty of that. Uh, so this is the map. And IP of this map suite sold to Esri last year. And it is part of Arches Maps SDK for Unity at the moment. And also it will be part of Arches Pro. Now, how we do it really, it is a simple things from planning all the way to uh, through orthophoto, 3 building, 3D building generation, and all those things. Uh, the only advantage being the automation and using a lot of, uh, let's say, machine learning. These are some of the examples we have created. Now, using this, we finished 14 million buildings in Turkey in six months. And it's sub meter, 10 centimeter GSD. Imagine this is like LOD3, and uh, at the moment, uh, Netherlands has only LOD2. And Germany is going for LOD3 for digital twin national uh, uh, project. And Istanbul, 6,000 square kilometer, 2 million buildings, fully automatic texture mapping, vegetation, and so on. Now, at the moment in Saudi Arabia, we did NEOM. NEOM is a project their biggest project, $500 billion project. And it will be a city 10 times bigger than Dubai. And there is also one project called The Line. If you go there, uh, 170 kilometers, train will take it in 20 minutes. There will be no cars along that one. There will be settlements and so on. So we have done the complete database for NEOM. By the way, in Neom, the Parsons is there, uh, Bechdel is there. Uh, lately, they signed an agreement for Metaverse with Unity. Snapchat is there. 
and uh, so you have uh, almost all the uh, players. So we have done for Neom everything from 18 centimeter GSD aerial imagery through orthophoto and a complete 3D cadastral mapping in the entire area. Because it is, then the next one is digital to win Alula, 23,500 square kilometer. We have done A to Z everything. And uh, with this Alula, we have nine ongoing projects. This picture here is, they call it El Maraya mirror uh, building. Everything is mirrored around. This is a 9,000 square meter building. And when you go there, you only see mountains. You don't see the building. Uh, by the way, uh, they have this all these um, uh, big occasions in that place. Now, BIM as a multi-scale digital twin base and so on. Uh, uh, this is something, uh, some research R&D project in Turkey we are doing, and also some R&D project we are doing here uh, together in Delft as well. GeoBIM, integrating BIM into GIS is another thing uh, uh, so important. Uh, probably at this moment, can I show how we integrate it? If I go to, uh, online here. Maybe I need your help. All right, that's great. Oh, that's good. Now I will show you something from uh, cloud. Our cloud is in Azure site in US. Uh, it, everything was created automatically, what I will show uh, using our mid-map suite, but it's uh, <coughs> exported to Azure. I will not take much time just uh, to show you these things. You can at least have an idea. Kapele is next to you, is in the Rotterdam. And uh, one uh, uh, Dutch company, uh, Slugboom, he provided us uh, with uh, uh, aerial images, stereo aerial images, and it is oblique and nadir, five centimeter and seven and a half centimeter. We didn't go to the field or anything. Everything created here automatically almost. You can see all these things and uh, you can play as you wish. Not only that, you can have the, all the attributes and so on, because this is an object, a represent as an object, and you can even see these facets and other things. So uh, I can go, for example, integrate one building with BIM. Now the entire thing is, is uh, intelligent. I can click something. You will have the information, all the walls, ceilings, all other information. Or I can go to certain level, for example, eight. Let me close this. See, only for that level now. I can play. Let's see what this one is. It says doors and so on. So it's in, uh, in your hand now to manage the building and to uh, integrate with. I will share with you. Another one, for example, I'll, uh, Let me go. Okay, like this one we have done. Can I close this home? Maybe that's good. I wanted to show you something. This is a. Elula, but let me see if I can show uh, uh, Dubai one. 
maybe they didn't put here on the cloud because it's the classified one. But anyway, let me continue with this uh, for you. This is my hometown. We did it. Uh, we are creating store maps, but uh, embedding uh, in this uh, one uh, our uh, digital twin as well. By the way, you can turn this one on and off because uh, buildings, for example, I can turn it off, they, they are objects. That's the whole thing, it's not mesh model. So uh, let me continue with other things more. Which one was it? Uh, okay, maybe this one, yes. All right, that's great. Now, co-creation process using digital twin, and it is MOROI project, DELT project, and uh, uh, your team and our team working together. Uh, uh, always, they are uh, really very uh, excited, uh, and there will be very good results together. Now, 3D cadastral and land management. This is something uh, at the moment uh, becoming very, very important, especially in developing countries. This is the pro these are the projects we are discussing with World Bank in developing countries, including Africa, uh, Central Asia, and so on. In Saudi Arabia, there is uh, no technical cadastral registration yet. And they are starting, there was a tender we participated. First urban area, almost 100,000 square kilometers, 15 million parcels. And I will not say that we have started, but most likely we are going to execute. It's a three year project. And uh, we are going to use intelligence a lot over that, especially for future extraction of boundaries. It is so important to create at least 80, 90 percent of uh, boundaries, parcels, and so on, automatically. There are some uh, tools from Esri. There are tools from others. But uh, think about this one. Uh, we are talking about 15 million parcels. So far, in Saudi Arabia, everything was just simple digital mapping. And the latest mapping was like 10 years ago. Now they are going for a complete cadastral registration. And before I sign, I will not say that I'm executing, but almost guaranteed that uh, nobody has these resources other than us over there to do that. I mean, there used to be some uh, European companies, FinMap, Hansa Luftbild, and so on. Now they disappear. The second one is already we are executing in Jeddah, 2,400 square kilometers. Already we finished the flying and we are uh, uh, now creating digital twins and we are going to create a uh, cadastre as well. For the, there are about 1 million parcels and buildings there. And it's already under execution. Any story, anything new, any technology, we are there to implement it. It is our project. And also 80 square kilometers, those uh, pink areas. I was there last week. This is uh, urban transformation, urban renewal. And uh, there are 200,000 parcels in it. We are uh, giving priority to do that. And there will be new planning in those areas, a complete new development. And we want to be that development part of our digital twin design, implementation, and uh, operation. Also, those are the projects we are in it. So these are very nice things, the, those slum area. Also, MIT is very interested in those areas for slum improvement and so on. 
similar one will be in Mecca and Medina. Now, joint projects with MIT. We have all these projects. City Scanner is the first project. Uh, we already, uh, we are uh, now uh, uh, that one. Uh, we got that project and preventing lighting pollution for dark skies. So we are awarded those two projects and doing together with MIT. From MIT, Carlo Ratti will be in it. And uh, Fabio Duarte, I heard that he was in Amsterdam yesterday and Simon Mora and so on. We are, they are going to have four professors and also uh, PhD and master's students. And then cadastral and land management, we are working on it together in developing countries. Smart city, they, they want to use the crowdsourcing data collection for better living condition and other things in the cities. Metaverse, we really, we, we want to start certain things which is very difficult in the real life, in the metaverse, in the virtual. So uh, as the time comes, we'll transfer to the real physical life. Now I'll work. I'll talk more about virtual holy places. Uh, it will come something. Uh, we are formulating some type of PPP project. Robot is the autonomous boat they developed for Amsterdam, and now we are trying to do those robots uh, in other cities in the Middle East and so on. Uh, autonomous boats, like using your all your cl cloud sourcing and all those things. Uh, Slums and property ownership. We want to have people uh, living in those uh, places. You have an iPhone, you can have the LiDAR and so on, you can load it. And people, uh, we can have the complete inventory of those poor area rather than expensive surveys. They, they did this, it worked very well in uh, South um, uh, America in Brazil. 3D morphology clustering, the cities, other things, work environment, uh, uh, Zoom, other things, uh, we are studying that together. So in these projects, I am in the board together with those people and we have uh, two meetings yearly and we are working together. Joint project with Delft University. I took it from Yavuz uh, and uh, the, one is MIPMAP is the leading system design tool based on open source, scalable, modular, and standardized neighborhood level digital tool. It's a long word. So anyway, they, they know better than me. The other one is the result one, we call it uh, partner. We are partner uh, tools to assess support uh, multi-actor decision-making on smart hybrid energy systems. And another one is learning community on hybrid energy systems. And the final one, component level predictive models and so on. By the way, we are keen. It is so great pleasure to work together with that and to be successful in these projects. And we will not sacrifice anything really to make this one successful. When we say we need it. <laughs> then the digital trans AR, VR and metaverse. Everything. We create digital twin. We want people to have even their games in that environment using the real digital twin data rather than imaginary one with the real city, with the real structures and so on. So, well, it, then it will be easy to run simulations and so on. Like we say in new, okay, architects plan, they are educated, but they don't live in that one. What do people think about it? I mean, you have very good, uh, I would say, understanding here, but in developing countries, only one person decides. We say that people should come and they should have their voice in my virtual environment. They cannot block that one. So, uh, for example, for this now, Orlando is developing the entire 40 square mile metro region, and they will have virtual inside the offices and the partnership, uh, uh, and they will have LED screens, people can work there, 360 degrees. Las Vegas, Los Angeles, New York, and Phoenix are also building out digital to into lower building emissions and clean city concepts and so on. 
They say that cities can save $280 billion by 2030 with this approach. Now, this is uh, one of the projects we are working. We are uh, shortlisted. There is, uh, they call it King Abdullah Financial District in Riyadh. There is a district, uh, there are uh, towers uh, all together. Uh, it is 1.6 square kilometer area. There are 100 towers, 57 already constructed, each of them huge. They want to do a complete digital twin GIS for design, for operation, maintenance, security, and so on. That's a huge project. And they spent for this project more than $20 billion. Now they want to make it smart, intelligent, so uh, it can work, uh, it can operate. Because at the end of the day, with digital twin, we want to be the brain of those people for command and control center and so on. Another project, that, like I said in uh, El Ula, the touristic area, there are 15,000 uh, archaeological sites. It is 10 times bigger than Petra in Jordan. And in this area, a, a complete uh, archaeology, tourism, and there are uh, villages 6,000 years old. And Saudi and French government had, uh, uh, let's say, a state agreement. There is a company in charge of that uh, in France. I will see them tomorrow. When they saw our digital twin and so on, they said, can we work here together and also in other countries to do those things? By the way, when I say that my dream is to do digital twin of Europe in coming two years, let us see. And so uh, over here, uh, Thales is involved. Maybe you know this defense company. And also uh, this old, I heard that 27,000 people working. And they are in it uh, tomorrow and after tomorrow we have the meetings. But uh, two weeks ago, I was in uh, over there. I've seen there are so many different departments, more than thousand expatriates working, but every department is doing their own GIS and their own work. We had a workshop and so I said, if I offer this, they said it would be miracle. If I develop this, it would be nice. Then we decided that across the, all the departments will have one system of the system. And uh, it will be cloud-based, mobile-based, and now we are going to work uh, AR, VR, and metaverse. We want people to hear, to have visit those area hours and hours as if you are there. And we want people to be in Neom uh, Seven Star Hotel at least for one night with virtual, let's say that, uh, in virtual environment. You can have your coffee here, but at least as if you are drinking over there. Then the, uh, these are all the projects uh, signed. We are executing, by the way. Implementing indoors for navigation space and asset management. Developing story maps. Everywhere we go, like if I say that, 50 interesting places. Digital twin will be in it for every place, history. Maybe with metaverse, we'll go 100 years back and I will see people living 100 years ago, then coming every, every 10 years. Then uh, serving this data to everybody, at least we came to a good level there. Now, jet digital, digital twin, virtual metaverse and practices. Jet that, that, that's the project we are executing. After within four to six months, we have digital, digital twin. We have so many other data, urban development, urban transformation. One condition there, they said, if you do so good work, make it sustainable. Let's establish a company. As a company, uh, maintain the data, serve the data. There are more than 100 government stakeholders and the public and so on. Saudi Arabia doesn't have an experience. We don't have an experience. At least in this area, you have 
such cadastres to survey others to certain extent. That is something uh, we are going to come up with a business model by the end of this year. That is, uh, the, uh, I would say, instruction from the highest authorities. But it is very good. Uh, I would say data is there, other things are there, and uh, the desire is there. And already we talked to banks and other things, they are ready to finance, but the only thing is missing over there, a good uh, business strategy and uh, a partner in AR, VR and Metaverse. I want people to do it from their iPhones. Like, I mean, the, I, this is only the design I, I did. There will be six companies under this uh, establishment, GIS company, gaming company, IoT, data analytics, hospitality, tourism, health, and so on. If you notice that R&D partners, I put MIT, Harvard, and Delft there, hopefully. <laughs> uh, MIT and Harvard, there, they have uh, uh, also representatives in this one. We are working together. Uh, officially, uh, Delft is not there yet. Uh, Hopefully, uh, that it will look at this. And so this is the model we want to work on it. Now, another one, we talked to uh, Minister of Hajj and others. There are 30 million visitors in Mecca Medina. And uh, very nice places. Uh, we want to have people to be trained, educated before they come and manage those people during the uh, let's say visit and also help after the visit and improve the services. Already, uh, I mean, again, the only thing missing here, we have the data Medina to Jesus to do in and Mecca, we are about to start and uh, Jetta, we have it. So it will be a complete thing. Like people will have the glass and will have uh, uh, just uh, board in the plane go out in jet, uh, go to those places with a yellow line in their glasses and visit all those places, including they go into their room. They live the same thing when they go there. This is a very ambitious project and we have the blessing of Saudi government and we have the part, the good partners. So uh, after 10 days, 15 days uh, or three weeks, we have uh, as a user conference in San Diego. We are going to have day and night meetings with uh, uh, AR, VR, and Metaverse people. So I wanted to share with you. This is the stage timeline for, to establish that. That means in the 2022, I have to come up with the strategy. And from 2023, it can be implemented. This is MIPMAP, and these are our offices in Ankara, Dev, uh, Dubai, uh, Saudi Arabia. Also, we have office in the US. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to leave uh, a little bit time for questions. <laughs> questions? Thank you very much for the great overview of many projects. And you pointed out that in many of those projects, there's a lot of integration. Uh, that's a nightmare. So I mean, it's a, it's a mess. Um, and um, what's the technological basis that you do these kind of integrations? So there are two big challenges from my perspective. One is the technological one. So what is the system structure? Are you integrating data based on a GIS? Or is, he, is the data rather being handled completely in a build system? Or are they completely separate from each other? So that's, that's with all the, the, the problems that you constantly have to, when you want to jointly use these data set that you have to do conversions or whatever. So that's a, that's a technological part. And the other part is of course the governance. So basically, who is continue because the digital twin needs constantly updating, and who's the owner in the end of, of, of that of that bunch of data? So two very difficult questions, I would say, but it would be really interesting to hear what you 
but uh, technology is not uh, really a big challenge. We have, uh, let's say, resources and capability. And the coordination with different people and bringing them together is the biggest challenge in developing countries. That's the reason I said, I mean, we are working with the top decision makers. Uh, and uh, there are, I mean, uh, I would say, Region, local projects, regional projects, and national projects. Cadaster is a national project, but the JET the municipality is a, a local project. Now, they have made the decision that uh, uh, we made the decision, we are going to establish the system of systems. And the, the, I would say the skeleton will be geospatial data, digital twins, and so on. GIS base, and the others will have at least access to that, and uh, we are uh, we will have at least a geometrically geographically correct positioning, so we, people can see it. People can only edit and use their own data, but they can access the other data. So it's, it's rather centered around a, G, a GIS based uh, uh, representation because I, I, I'm a bit skeptical because when I deal with the people from the my film community, they see it exactly the other way around. So they say, okay, give all what might be interesting for the GIS, we are all maintaining it within the system. No, so when I see my integration, they will come yeah. to us. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's, really it's a challenge, it's a challenge. Sure, they, are, they have the money, they are stronger, but now they realize when, what I can offer. Like planning people say that, it's planning, GIS is only my tool. When I say that, I will offer you from utilities to everything and I will offer you applications, all this tailoring. They said, I'm part of it. They were developing their own application each department. Yeah. So I said, I'm going to have a dashboard for you. You just click on it, you see the summary and you use it. It, always they thought that I'm going to take their data. I said no, never. Okay, so, so for start with data integration can be a nightmare combining so many departments and different applications. Uh, I would expect that you would have answers if something like, hey, yeah, but we use standards to realize this information infrastructure. Or, uh, I did not hear you that in your answer. But they did also not see it in your presentation, something about standards. Uh, Very good point. Uh, I mean, everything we do in those countries, according to ISO and other standards we are following. And uh, also, mm, uh, I would say, uh, now we have special data infrastructure, let's say in Saudi Arabia, in uh, Arab Emirates, and in Turkey. We are, uh, to integrate, we are closely following those. Yeah, the, the, the SDI is a information infrastructure getting yeah, yes. very different. So this, is this based on, on ODC standards, for example? So it's sort of like, like that's right. Central data, central thing, data standards data. are from ISO and uh, also OGC. Uh, I mean, we don't use any proprietary things at all. Okay. Even my, uh, I would say, uh, uh, Midmap Suite is OBG and so on. But the right way we convert to city GML and so on. Otherwise, as you said, Peter, that we cannot uh, integrate. Only Jet the municipality has 800 layers. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Um, maybe I, I think to all the most work about indoor. Um, what was it about? I think you did not cover the Yes, indoor is something uh, we are working together. Um, we are the, like, got the specialty from ESRI. ESRI product indoors, we are using, let's say, that uh, 3D buildings uh, completely, I would say, and with the sensors and others, including navigation for the space, asset management, space management, and so on. We are using indoors applications. Also, 
Well, we did that one implemented in uh, uh, campus university in Istanbul. And now for this huge project, 57 towers, we are competing with the hexagon and CMAS. Only that one I didn't get. <laughs> One more question. At the beginning of the presentation, you showed some uh, three building models that have been constructed. So, uh, and my question is so you also make a semantic reconstruction. So that means the buildings, first of all, everybody knows that it is a building, but what about the further subdivision? So, like, we also uh, have semantically tagged surface. So, so for example, say that is a roof surface, that's a wall surface, and also the models that show the windows are the windows themselves individual objects. Yes, good question. First, we do the semantics, then we do the real, uh, let's say, facades and so on. Uh, even I have an option here. You can say that forget the real facades, forget the real windows. Still, I you can have those things. But now, uh, not always all the windows, correct measurements are there, but they are not objects. But uh, I would say the whole building in an object, facades are object, let's say. Some other, uh, I would say, uh, structure are objects, but we are trying to minimize those things uh, for the speed and so on. Because that would be really interesting. Because since since you have only three, it really means that you that you have a that you that you have the facades subdivided again into doors, window objects, and every object is really clickable and is really individually um, accessible. And of course, that's very useful information when you do all kinds of energetic estimations or or, or something like that. So and, um, what I learned from many real world projects is if you present. And, and, and highly detailed visualization to citizens who are living there. If that visualization is wrong, but it is very high resolution, they are really ignoring it. They are really hating it because they say that does not look like it is in reality here. And uh, if you show that to um, somebody from higher levels or who are not familiar with, the, with, that, with that area, they find it very nice because it looks so realistic. But um, when you want to discuss with citizens and, and, and at the very local place, it is very dangerous on, on, on presenting high levels of, of detail because they are really going against it. Yes, uh, to give you an example, uh, for example, uh, our say one object building, but with, from architectural drawing beam and so on, we are getting that intelligence you, may, you mentioned. We integrated, for example, 15,000 buildings in Ankara in one week just from cat drawings but including them also semantic decomposition into that's right into the object. yes and the second thing there was a huge mask and the architectural drawing had 20 billion polygons or something you could not open really so in our case as an object and so on it came down to a couple of hundred nobody can notice i mean between that visualization and our visualization. So that's the difference, the big difference. When we say cadaster with my digital twin, we are integrating all these architectural drawings inside as well. Otherwise, uh, so it's another object inside our building. You mentioned that you were setting up 3D cadaster already in systems various places uh, and typically there is a the spatial side with the geometry the extent of the parcels and there is the legal side okay what type of right and uh, what person is involved uh, in, in these projects how, how is that connected say the, the spatial and the legal information well that's a little bit in those places are not very well uh, established and for the moment, we just want to see the ownership first. And then the legal rights and other things yeah. uh, will be part of it. And uh, because even uh, underground utilities, other things. Uh, so uh, even we don't have uh, all these, let's say, titles and so on, have no coordinate at the moment. And 
five different people can claim the same place. It is so vague, the definition. But how are these, say, conflicts uh, resolved? Uh, if you say multiple claims on the same location? Well, I'm telling people, they said that this should be the court case, each of them. We said no. If there is no conflict between the neighbors, let's go, uh, go ahead and probably I will do 95% cadaster. The others who cannot come to agreement, let them go to uh, legal uh, ways and so on. This is now accepted uh, by Saudi government. And that way I can have the, uh, let's say, jet that maybe 95% real cadaster. That will be the first case, that's the reason. I want, I'm so glad to be here. Uh, we want to learn from the experiences of, from Australia to uh, Netherlands and other things, uh, because uh, fit the purpose, we call it. We cannot go lengthy one. One time they did a pilot project, 600 parcels of something. It took them five years because nobody can agree. Because all the dimension before, there is no angle, only the length. Yeah. If people have no problem, so such... Exactly. Okay. We say the same thing. Neighbors, you have no problem. Even I, if I touch it, you will look Do they have to for the registration? Do you set up a system? Or do they just have a yes. parcels? You are the owner. Yes. Do they say, yeah, okay, I agree. I'm the owner of this in this yes. boundary. Yeah. It will go that way. Yeah. Then we say, I don't need judge. I don't need anybody. Only if there is a court, let them go there and fight forever. That means basically every time after the court session, some more portion of geometry will get instantiated. That's right. Okay. Is there another question? Yeah, the comment? Yeah, I just the connection with the Caribbean is very friendly for uh, trying to take advantage of these three uh, models. I mean, to uh, try to look for another portfolio for, for the machinery, or, or also to try to find a new tool methodology in order to, yeah, to make this uh, to provide the new polygon. Uh, yeah, that's first question. Let me answer that. I'm a academician as well. It's always I want to stay on the practical and the industry and academy as well. Academy for this purpose, like. We, I especially came here for cloud sourcing and other things. So I can see the change detection, for example, and using the new research and development. And it is so important for us. Also, I mean, I can do the analysis for certain things using the technology. And also we want to add, let's say that like indoors, other things to our GIS and others. So uh, also, like, I mean, uh, we are okay with the uh, future extraction to certain percentage. Still, if it is 70%, I have to go through every polygon again. So if I, I have to go higher, like 90, 95%, we would say that if you have 30% problem, do it uh, from scratch. So, these are the things. Every time we add a new story, like we added gaming before, now we are adding a different analysis to it. And also we are very well integrating different sources. Like we had a project in Tanzania, we were using cloud sourcing, LIDAR, other things, and helping all those things. And like in nuclear site selection in Saudi Arabia, uh, so many different analysis we are, we are able to carry with this academics, I would say, uh, help as well. Uh, plus uh, like iPhone LiDAR 12 and 13. So always uh, we want to be part of it. 
all other mapping companies in Europe, they closed because they were only doing photogrammetric mapping. Second question. Yeah, second question is, you, you mentioned that it's more simply for the imagination. Yes. So my question is, uh, what, what are the current thinking of the uh, idea of the photogrammetry because I can't know. Uh, so you will ask that it's very important to build this uh, Yes. Well, uh, initially I was UN expert. I am retired from UN. Then uh, in every country, I was criticizing uh, the quality of work professionals. And they said, if you criticize, why don't you open your own consultancy and uh, go to the market? So I decided it was very, uh, I would say, wild uh, decision. Then uh, at the moment, we have 12 PhDs in the company. And uh, R and D and other things, uh, Yavuz is running with others, and uh, uh, they are enjoying. It. So we really invest on R and D as well. It's not like private company. Everything do projects goes back to the company. That's a very nice answer. Given the time, I'm. Great that we uh, have to move into the next speaker. But first, uh, we'd like to thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. And also with a small present. <laughs> and at the end of the day, we go back to the guy who wrote this book. I think you, he also had the first presentation today in the morning in the aula. Now he will give a more in-depth presentation, uh, and uh, yeah, he's the last speaker of uh, the seminar. So I think the floor is yours. You put it already over here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to my presentation today. So I will talk about uh, what I did for my PhD, basically a recap. So I will first uh, present the background of my PhD research and show you the motivation of it. And then following this, uh, a two uh, novel, uh, two uh, the three contributions I made during the research. Uh, research. So first one is a continuous level of importance method of visualizing uh, massive points. Second is uh, in the histogram approach for curing non-uniformly distributed uh, points. The second is uh, how can we execute in convex polytope, which is a, a generic representation of uh, different geometries uh, on point class. So, and the, the last is uh, I will show you how I use, uh, design a benchmark to verify these different uh, uh, structures and algorithms. So no, nowadays we have so many uh, uh, machines, scanners uh, to collect the points. To name, to name the, a few, the most popular one is the laser scanners. So this machine sends uh, laser poses and get it back and then uh, pick, make a picture of the full, the full environment by point clouds. And also the conventional GPS. So uh, one point actually represents the, the position of people or a vessel or a, a vehicle at a certain time. So uh, uh, by collecting this during a period, you also make a large point cloud. And this point cloud are indeed very useful for uh, current applications. For example, to remodeling the forest estimation, uh, the gaming, uh, VR stuff and the autonomous driving. So very important data. <laughs> and uh, the main features of the point cloud is first the re really huge volume. Right? So we made an estimation that the laser scanning of all streets in the Netherlands can finally reach uh, 10 to the power of 15 points. So that's not very uh, large uh, value. Uh, uh, and another character is the multiple dimensions of points besides the X, Y, Z, so those conventional uh, spatial dimensions. For example, for the laser scanning, uh, 
also uh, you also retrieve the intensity uh, uh, for each point. So the strength uh, uh, of uh, the point, uh, the signal strength of a point, this can reflect the material uh, of that part. And uh, of, of course, after post processing, you can also classify this point. So a point can belong to a table or belong to a wall. And also you can add a level of importance for visualizing them. So we, we treat this as an independent dimension. The GPS, you can, uh, the point can contain time and speed. For that. And also we can uh, get points from, uh, for example, by using density ma image matching. So this uh, significantly reduces the cost of collecting those massive points. And in this, uh, in this data site, uh, you can also retrieve color, for example, also normal vectors to visualize. To generate so so because uh, due to so many dimensions that we call our research object the ND point cloud. So then the motivation previously to manage this uh, massive ND point cloud data, uh, 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 researchers or developers has invent, uh, mostly used uh, file based solutions. So the, this for for this kind of solution. Uh, uh, people normally need to redevelop uh, different functions, uh, processing algorithms, uh, programs by themselves, just, just for specific use. So this needs a lot of uh, energy and the input. Uh, and for, an for another, it's very difficult to in uh, integrate uh, the, the file-based uh, uh, solution solutions with other special data representations. Uh, for example, if uh, you you use the lens files to store point cloud, but uh, what uh, what 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 can you do when you want to curate or combine with the shape files? So it's uh, quite difficult. So that uh, it uh, makes the database, uh, uh, you know, uh, ranked uh, before the file based uh, solutions. So uh, to conventional um, database systems use block based solutions. For example, the R tree, so which uh, we are very familiar with. So it, it, it uh, makes blocks of uh, uh, the points uh, to retrieve, uh, to reach a sta status that uh, there are minimum overlap uh, between different blocks. And then we build a tree on top of that. And also the, uh, to, to, to the power n tree. So in 2D, uh, this is a quadri structure and 3D arc tree. So as you can imagine, uh, it basically uh, split the whole space evenly. Uh, also depending on the uh, density of points and uh, then make the tree structure. However, uh, those uh, block-based solutions uh, uh, are mainly proposed to deal with, are uh, developed to deal with 2D or 3D solutions. And uh, they are still the, the main uh, applications actually currently in geomatics. Uh, However, they, uh, they cannot be easily extended to ND. Uh, and also the block-based solutions uh, uh, has uh, uh, suffer from the intensive CPU unpacking operations because uh, if you retrieve these blocks from the, uh, the disk and in the CPU, you have to unblock them to then to, to, to restore it to the coordinates and then to use them. So such an unpacking is to prove to be very CPU intensive, cost, cost a lot, lot of time. And the, the third problem is that uh, with this block, you, uh, you will see the boundary shock during the visualization simply because you uh, select the blocks at different levels of the tree and the different uh, levels have different density. That was sorry. Uh, so what we actually want to achieve is a continuous you know, level of importance to realize a smooth translation of the view. Uh, it makes uh, uh, the, the viewer more comfortable uh, with the, the scene, the view. Uh, so our group uh, proposed a potential solution for this. Uh, we call it the plan as of C. Uh, basically, uh, uh, <clears throat> a, a, a very a representative for space filling curve is the Martin curve. Basically, uh, for example, uh, you have a 2D point and the coordinate is two, three. And what you do is to first uh, convert the coordinates into its binary representation. 
and then you interleave the bits of uh, these dimensions, and then you get the Morton key actually. So you can in this way you convert a two D point, uh, two number into the one D one D key, and uh, and this interleaving bits mechanism can be applied to three D and even N D cases. So in that in that case you you convert from N D uh, point into a one D key. It's the same, it contains the same information, but now you, you reduce the dimensionality to 1D so that uh, uh, for this 1D case, you can adopt the BT, the one dimensional indexing structures uh, uh, to index and organize the data. Uh, and uh, uh, alongside the SFCK, you can store other uh, property dimensions we call, for example, the RGB values because they, they may not be pure often. So, so we uh, have group design this. Uh, and when cure, when curing, uh, you have also to convert the 2D uh, query windows or, or the query windows to the 1D ranges so that you can select because in a storage, you store, store the 1D keys. So when query, you should also use the 1D ranges to query. So uh, the mechanism is to uh, we, we, we recursively decompose the space to uh, approach uh, the curate geometry until we find the consecutive uh, uh, pieces of these uh, uh, curves, and then uh, uh, for the and then uh, the, the each consecutive curve correspond to a one D range, and then uh, during the query we use this one uh, D ranges uh, to retrieve uh, uh, the data back. So this uh, mechanism can also handle uh, more uh, curate geometry. For example, a circle, a circle, a ball. Uh, so it's a very generic mechanism. However, uh, uh, this solution uh, didn't consider of the point of distribution. So uh, it uh, mechanically decomposed the space. Uh, so uh, in, in that case, uh, you, you, can, uh, you will get actually empty uh, uh, regions. So that corresponds at empty uh, 1D range. So they are useless, but you still, uh, generate this and use it for curing. So this uh, makes uh, it uh, less efficient. Uh, but what we want is actually a smart uh, decomposition of the uh, space and the more efficient ranges so that you can use a la larger uh, range for those sparse areas, but the more denser with the smaller uh, uh, ranges to achieve uh, higher uh, efficiency. Uh, also, the, uh, the plan SFC provides no efficient operator for generic indicurity geometries. Uh, although I showed you the circle, but for example, if you uh, you can make an irregular shape of the road, and if you uh, also consider other dimensions, for example, the level of importance, this makes the the, the query more complex. And uh, currently, plan SFC. Uh, uh, not current, the plan SFC hasn't solved it that yet. Uh, and also the benchmark tests are very simple, like use cases. So that makes uh, up this uh, research question, it's a PhD research. So uh, what I actually do is to uh, research, develop an efficient independent cloud data structure supporting these different uh, applications. And I, I mainly focus on three aspects. The first is I mentioned. So, can we propose a continuous level importance uh, scheme for any point cloud, and, by, and how to compute that, and uh, uh, how the point distribution influence the query performance, and can we deal with also uh, this uh, this point, this problem, uh, and also the uh, what other geometries, query irregular geometries, can be handled during the data structure, and do we need to propose? Uh, uh, new algorithms. Um, so I elaborate this in the, in my PhD research. So uh, I will show you the result. The first is the CLOOI for indie point cloud. So what uh, we actually do is uh, first uh, we we study the current distributions of the points. Uh, if you use a quartry or octree, uh, you you will experience the the the, the jump during uh, of a number of points between different levels, right? Uh, you, you normally have uh, uh, two times more points in the level below, uh, and then two times more points because you're using a tree structure, a quartry structure, for example. Uh, 
Uh, however, as you can see, it uh, follows uh, actually exponential distribution. So, so, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, so the number of points actually, and the zoom level. Uh, if we make uh, the levels denser, we can finally retrieve this line. Uh, and finally, uh, we can reach a status that each point can represent a level. And to uh, deduce the, the, uh, the, the level for a specific point, uh, we, we, we use this uh, 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 retrieve, uh, the, the exponential distribution we, we discovered by, by following the previous tree structure. And then uh, uh, we randomly uh, assign this, uh, uh, this number to different points to, to realize the uh, continuous level of the, uh, importance. Uh, so how do we use the, the, the continuous level of importance? It's uh, uh, still the main use case is the uh, 3D perspective view selection. Um, so first, uh, you have a 3D view thruster uh, to confine your, your view. And then you want to realize uh, a mechanism that far away, you will see less points, but near you, you want to see more points, more uh, details. Uh, so in this way, uh, you can uh, leverage the CIOI here uh, with the distance. So with this, uh, uh, you can re uh, realize the, the smooth transition. But also, you may also consider the eccentricity. Basically, uh, that, that's the perception uh, point of view. Uh, we normally see more details in the central of our view uh, than the, on the two sides. You can also uh, take this into account and uh, uh, equation it. So you establish this uh, uh, constraint, and finally you put this into your query to realize uh, uh, the cont cont continuous uh, view. And here are some results. So uh, the pr the previous one is uh, you can see the blocks, still the discrete blocks, but uh, with the uh, our COI, and you can realize the distance uh, translation and also the eccentricity effect. Uh, so the next uh, contribution is the ND histogram. Uh, uh, so th this is basically repeat uh, what I said. Suppose uh, we only use 10 ranges for the query. And the pre previous using a plan as I've said, it uh, mechanically split uh, the space to approach the query geometry. So in this way, you, you see this empty, you, you have this empty ranges. But you you also select uh, in the final result you select a lot of uh, false positives. Uh, in this way, uh, the really generated content nearly half the false positives. So that's not what we want. Uh, uh, by using uh, Andy histogram, so Andy Andy histogram is to first uh, you uh, decompose the space uh, using the two to uh, the the quadri two quadri, for example in two D. And you, uh, you you count how many points in, in this uh, quadrant region, and then finally uh, then you put them in a tree structure, so that uh, uh, when you query you re refer to this uh, uh, ND histogram tree to generate the ranges. So in this way you can see from here it uh, adapts to the distribution of points, and uh, with the, still with the ten uh, ranges. You, this time you get much, uh, much less uh, false positives. So this is the compact set of in the histogram. Uh, here the, the, the diagram shows the whole workflow of uh, uh, the uh, our new solution. So basically you encode uh, uh, the point clouds from n dimensions to the 1DS Morton case, and then you use a B tree to manage it. Uh, uh, for, and for the query, you can use uh, the histogram uh, tree to get, get the generation of the ranges to ap approximate uh, your original query geometry. And then you generate the 1D ranges and you join these uh, two tables to, to retrieve the keys. And, and then after it, you do a, 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 a second filtering to, to filter out those um, uh, false positive points. Uh, to uh, you, you may also ask 
okay, uh, ND histogram can be helpful, but how help, uh, how, how much it can help, right? That this is uh, somehow we want to know. So in what cases uh, you 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 definitely need ND histogram? Is it uh, always needed? So for to investigate this uh, problem, uh, also establish mathematical fun, uh, foundations. So we propose a metric which uh, describes the uniformity of uh, the ND points. Uh, the uh, distribution in the nd space so actually this is proportion this uh, metric is proportional to the uniformity so the larger uh, chc that means uh, your points are more uniformly distributed in the space and uh, then uh, by deriving the mathematics uh, we, we derive that uh, uh, when points are uh, skewly, very skewly distributed then your nd histogram works uh, uh, the uh, better and you need it. So you you uh, you first uh, use CHC to 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 describe to compute the CHC of a data set for you to design whether you really need to use any histogram. So uh, and then we 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 did uh, simulations to verify this. Uh, we use different distributions uh, to uh, to to make. Uh, uh, to you know, design different data sites. So for uh, the first uh, two dimensions follow uniform distribution, and then when when you you use three D, you you add those uh, 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 you add the third dimension, but following different distributions. You see you see there are always a sharp and the tender uh, uh, variation in each uh, uh, dimension. So with this, you can uh, ver verify the skewness or the uniformity of different data sets as you can see from from here the dg5 uh, uh, always use the sharp always use, use the sharp uh, distribution so you can imagine in the nd it's a very skewly distributed it's only a small part of the nd space so you get a very small value of the cumulative hypercubic uh, this metric cumulative hypercubic uh, uh, coverage and then you will observe a high effectiveness of ND histogram. So this this simulation is uh, ver verified after theorem. A third uh, contribution is the convex polytope query. Uh, so why, why why do we study this? As I mentioned, so uh, it's uh, the the query uh, geo geographic queries are not always uh, windows, so orthogonal windows. But for example, uh, the uh, the trend. Careers, it's a very irregular shape, and if you want to know whether the chain uh, will uh, hit or uh, touch the branches of the trees, you will do such a, a spatial join computation to check whether your terrain point cloud uh, intersects with your your career shape. Uh, but uh, however, with the current solution, you will, you can only use the boxes, the, 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 a large box, for example, uh, that. Uh, which has the contains the the ships uh, the the chain chain carrier to to select points. So this uh, is very slow. This cause a lot of false positive select points selected. And also uh, for the perspective view selection, I showed you the CLI use. Uh, it's also an irregular kind of, uh, a re irregular query geometry, right? Because the CLI is proportional to the distance, which is a quadratic term of the the x, y, and z. So it's not linear. Uh, so how, how can you model this? Uh, so we also want to realize the, uh, that uh, using uh, our uh, plans, based on our plan as say, approach. So for this, we propose the polytope model, convex polytope model, uh, where we use half spaces uh, to define a convex polytope. So it is a set of these uh, you know, half space, spaces, uh, and uh, you, you define uh, the, the direction of a space uh, uh, by the omega and the beta. So with this, you define one half space, and uh, using a set of these uh, parameters, uh, you, can, you can define a convex polytope. And you, you then use this set of uh, uh, parameters for your query. And we developed uh, uh, algorithms for this. Actually, we propose uh, three different algorithms. The first, um, they are all based on the single half space detection. So to, to detect whether your, uh, 
your uh, node, your SFC node intersect with the as if, uh, with the half space uh, with the polytope, you first uh, detect whether it uh, uh, intersects with the one of the half spaces. So the sweep algorithm is based on the uh, movement of the half space, where, which uh, uh, we describe here. Uh, and only, only, and with using it, you can detect the different types uh, of the uh, relationship, uh, spatial relationship between uh, SFC uh, node and the uh, the polytope. And then you have a sphere method, uh, which is much uh, straightforward. You just uh, uh, compute a, a, a sphere that's around uh, the SFC node and compute the, the distance from the, the, the center of the, uh, the sphere to the half space to detect whether they intersect. Uh, and then you, you, you select uh, uh, the points. And the IBM uh, and the, the final one is the CPLEX, which is a, program, a linear programming method. It's more rigorous. Uh, and I compared the results of this three algorithm. Uh, and you can see the, the CPLEX returned the accurate result. Uh, and the, then after this is the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the sweep uh, algorithm. So not, not clear, but uh, this uh, green ones are the first positive uh, return by sweep, and the most uh, are belong to the sphere. So uh, I use a real world uh, uh, application to verify uh, my solution or, or, or the innovations. Uh, so actually we compared uh, uh, all the existing state of the art, for example, post GIS block solution, so we basically utilize a 4B multi-point geometry. So it contains X, Y, Z, and an M dimension. And the M here is the CLOI. Uh, uh, it refers to the CLOI uh, uh, we de designed. Uh, and we have Oracle solutions uh, uh, as new PC. But uh, however, it can only support the 2D X, Y organizations. Uh, and uh, we also compared the uh, the solutions from, from computer scientists. They, they designed the, the ND, real ND solution, data management solution. So uh, they, uh, their method uh, decompose the uh, space, the partition, uh, the data uh, into different pyramids. So it, this is quite different from the KD tree or R tree, or, uh, which use the blocks. You see, they use the, the pyramid to, 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 to partition the data. And so in this way, if you do a query, like uh, you see here, uh, you do a query uh, uh, that uh, touches all the blocks, uh, the uh, co conditional tree structures will return all the blocks, but there's, you skip part of it. So, so, so as you can see, their approach caters uh, uh, the best to the uh, orthogonal window queries, right? So it, it's just uh, uh, perfectly uh, adapted to that one. Uh, and they also re research on the point distribution uh, problem. So the, the, what they did is to uh, move the, the, the top of the pyramid to the center of the, the data and also uh, redesign the, uh, the partition to improve the query performance on um, not uniformly distributed data. Of course, uh, uh, we also test our own method with, uh, with the NDA histogram. So our data is the Dutch national point cloud data set. Uh, containing 10 billion points. And uh, we, split it, we split this data into five tiles. And, uh, yeah, and in each data set, we, we, we add one tile uh, so that you will get an increase in uh, data set. So in this way, we, we, we can learn the scalability of our solution. Uh, we also designed the uh, different uh, windows uh, so this uh, a query window. So this query window has different selectivity on different dimensions uh, uh, to test for testing. So this is the performance of these uh, solutions in this uh, different uh, uh, for, for for these different uh, queries. As you can see, our uh, uh, HFC HFC means PLFC using the ND histogram. So always uh, ranks last. But here it's a bit. Uh, rather uh, surprising that uh, Pussy GS uh, uh, can work uh, the, the fastest. Uh, yeah, um, because this is because the small three is mainly like a 2D uh, 
uh, selection, it selects all, all the full range of the Z and full range of the CIOI. So for the 2D, you, you see the, the original block-based solutions can, can really uh, make you satisfactory. Uh, but for others, uh, uh, where, where um, the selectivity varies a lot uh, uh, between different uh, dimensions, other solutions, uh, you know, uh, ranks the, the best, the first. Uh, and of course, uh, we use the uh, our polytope curing uh, method uh, to realize the uh, perspective view selection. And as you can see here, uh, that uh, we, we we finally realize a smooth transition transition of our view instead of the uh, sharp blocks. And uh, uh, I also adopted uh, uh, this into uh, flood uh, modeling results. So for, uh, for <clears throat> uh, so basically we do flood mapping uh, based on um, <clears throat> we do the flood risk uh, analysis based on on modeling results. So we basically uh, give the model different scenarios, see different precipitation, uh, and uh, where where the decks can damage. We use this uh, different scenario and we compute the results and based on a lot of uh, result large volume of the simulation results, we define the risk areas so that we have a basic feeling before the flood comes that we are, which region is the most dangerous. So such a, a huge modern results uh, can be hardly managed by the rasters because, for, uh, because one, one part is that we, we, this model, the hydrologic model based on the tri triangular mesh. So it's not really great actually. So when you when you when you start using the, the rasters, you will have to average average the, the, the computing results where you lost the accuracy. Uh, and also then the converted rasters may contain a lot of empty cells. However, if you treat this uh, triangular cells uh, as a one point, so you use the syndroid of a triangular each as a point, and then for each point you can store the x y z t under the flow velocity, for example. And the depths, you 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 can turn the whole uh, modeling results into the ND point cloud representation and use our solution to solve these uh, risky risk queries. So that is, is the basic uh, uh, thinking behind. Uh, and then we uh, we also test it. We we use different uh, cases. So uh, so for example, in the uh, data set two, we we use two cases. So it contains two scenarios. And uh, the, the fourth one contains eight scenarios. So you, with this, we, we, we can have different uh, skills of the data and test the scalability. Uh, for the queries, uh, we, we you know, designed the, the queries uh, really practical, really uh, used in practice. For example, we want areas that uh, is uh, with flood depth greater than three meters. So this, uh, this uh, uh, regions need to be saved actually. Uh, during uh, before the flood, so so people have to ev ev evacuate it. So and also the the uh, we we part of the uh, the, the area can, that will experience floods within twenty four hours. Uh, despite this uh, normal selection, we also have the instability. Very uh, very interesting that uh, the hydrologists define the general area uh, by uh, in instability parameter. So its depth multiplied by velocity. Basically, this says not only the depth, but if, if the depth is small, but it's, uh, the flow velocity is very, uh, very high, it's also dangerous, right? The people cannot stand there. So this is a linear, a non-linear uh, constraint. And then we use polytope for this, as I will show you later. So we compare different uh, strategy uh, solutions and still we, we saw the uh, uh, that uh, the strength of our uh, approach using the anti histogram. And for the, uh, the instability uh, query, we use this half spaces to, to, to define the query shape. And then we, we tested the uh, different uh, algorithms and the sweep uh, performed the best. And for the host risk, risk basically you want to know uh, uh, the, the flood inundation situation around this uh, Houses uh, <clears throat> and also road risk. Which part of the road is risk? 
uh, is risky based on the flow velocity. Uh, so, so these are very useful queries and can be uh, efficiently done by the any point cloud. But as you can see, such an irregular shift uh, should be very difficult to solve using the, the block based, right? Because uh, you, you, you have so many blocks intersect uh, such a, uh, a irregular shape. So, and uh, then, uh, his, uh, uh, his, as you say, so using any histogram uh, performs very well. Uh, but for this one, uh, uh, you see, uh, uh, yeah, because this road is mainly 2D. So the 2D based blocks still can, can work so fast. So, so in this case, I, I didn't test it to, into 8D, but uh, 2D. So for 2D spatial, uh, it's, it's, still, it's still acceptable. And we also extend our solutions uh, to more applications. For example, the change detection and uh, uh, AR, uh, augmented reality. And in the future, we do think uh, we can adapt and optimize our solution for more applications. Uh, and that's it. That's uh, all my Yeah, summarizing four or five years in 30, 35 minutes, <laughs> a lot of content. Uh, yeah, you had questions from the committee already this morning, but maybe there are pending questions from the audience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, So you mean my uh, approach all the previous uh, blocks? Uh, yeah, indeed. Uh, if you want to uh, to query a uh, different dimension other than X, Y, Z, you put it uh, into the modeling curve uh, during the encoding of the K. And then uh, with generation of radius, uh, right? It will certainly consider uh, the influence of this uh, new dimension. So in this way, uh, you, can, you can select uh, more efficiently. Otherwise, you have to scan all the data and then uh, uh, checks uh, each point one by one whether that dimension. Ah. Like instead of like just adding up like a chain, would you rather just you know redo it again and just uh, hold it with first? Ah, uh, yeah, good question. Uh, so uh, during a coding of the key, we uh, what we want to achieve is uh, the equal importance in the K. So what we, uh, what we do is to uh, guarantee that before encoding of the modern K, we make them the same length. For example, if you have only have 10 classes, okay, one from two to 10, but your X, Y is from one to 1,000. Uh, apparently, they are at different level, but the encoding, uh, you, you, the, the influence of the classification is so small because uh, X, Y will occupy the, uh, the highest part of the actual K. In that case, we will modify the, uh, the classification by a large number, for example, 1,000, to make them equal, equally important. In that case, uh, if they are equally uh, important, then uh, the, the order of this dimension is, uh, doesn't really matter. Oh, okay. yeah. So yeah. 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 For your flat analysis, also we are doing some flat analysis and we are using, let's say, that a pixel resolution continuous trail. Mm -hmm. And also, you can include there, let's say, soil type, other things, and so on. Mm -hmm. So I haven't seen that in your uh, presentation. Ah, uh, for, uh, for, 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 the, uh, for, for my work, I did actually, it's the management of the modeling result. Instead of using point cloud for the model, so perhaps what what you want to achieve is that uh, uh, you have a basic uh, a train data set. Let's say point cloud, and each point uh, uh, can have property of the soil, and you you use this point cloud as input for a model, hydraulic model, yes. uh, and then for the computation. So 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 I haven't uh, reached the, uh, that step yet, but uh, uh, that that's more about the computer. 
patient with their point of uh, where I here I address the story uh, management of the point. So basically, uh, uh, we, we get the results from a, a hydraulic model, and then we convert this result to point cloud, and then to compute it instead of the, uh, uh, the, the stage uh, at the beginning. But uh, uh, that is a very interesting uh, point. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, because I, 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 I have background in hydraulic before. I know that a lot of I know that. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 there's a lot of info about. So it's not only the terrain, but also the soil types, the precipitation. And if you can use the NDA a point set to record all this, all the things. Yeah, on yeah, you can only do this single data set. That's a that, that's a very novel idea. Uh, maybe uh, maybe uh, elaborate to a little bit. Yes, it's the starting point. Starting point of uh, uh, the engine point cloud, and uh, more people get joined. Uh, we can do more fantastic data. Thomas, a question. Can you imagine um, using a string as the input as an organization dimension? Yeah. So could you, could you imagine an application or a use case where where people are not just saying I have just a number, which I have to encode in the board encode, but maybe even a word or maybe in a sentence? Yeah, yeah that, that's a very interesting point. Uh, basically, what, what, I, what I do currently is to convert this uh, word into numbers. So that means, uh, yeah, that's a very brute force uh, solution. So you have a, you have a dictionary like uh, table and uh, you have each word uh, corresponding to a number. And then with, with the numbers, you encode the, the, the solution. But when you retrieve it out, you have to refer to the, uh, for that. That could, that could make an interesting use case, as you said. Because, uh, for example, if you think about making Twitter analysis uh, of uh, sentiment, sentiment analysis of Twitter messages. Mm -hmm. So you can classify Twitter messages whether people are happy, unhappy, or angry, or, or whatever. So in Twitter messages also have a geolocation, they have a time, and also that kind of uh, extra information about the emotion. Of course, if you would do that, that, that word that describes the emotion would be mapped to a dictionary. Of course, that would then also allow to make interesting searches or queries over larger areas of the country, maybe, and asking whether at the same time all people like another, because maybe all the global events or whatever. So I think that's that could be an interesting uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I do admit, but. Uh... Uh, for, for, for that, for, for first encoding, for the storage, I have another idea actually, because we have only 26 uh, letters, right? Uh, we can indeed use two bits for, for each of these letters. Right? And then you, 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 you can convert any word into the, those uh, numbers. But, but, but then the, uh, the, actual, uh, the, the bottleneck then becomes to, to interpret the, uh, the, uh, these numbers. Then perhaps the deep learning or machine learning still need to be adopted to, to, to because the, the, the computer cannot understand the semantic meaning uh, behind this. Uh, we, we need to co uh, collaborate with the people doing the post processing. I think that that, that, can, that can be a, a good joint research. Small questions. Then, if not, uh, I would like to thank uh, I change one more time. One more present. And by the way, uh, a message from the secretariat. Oh. You can also get a small present from the faculty. Oh. Oh, great. Uh, it's good to walk by no. today or tomorrow no. and collect yeah. your uh, small <laughs> present token from the, from the faculty. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we are at the end of the session today. It has been a long day, <laughs> starting early with the PhD defense and uh, listening to the defense. And now having four very interesting uh, presentations and uh, also very lively discussions uh, afterwards. Uh, I would like to thank you all, both the speakers and the audience uh, for this uh, yeah, interactive sessions. They have been recorded, so I will now stop the recording. Mm. Well, stop.